This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Podcast presented by GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Chris Blades, and we got a packed show for you here today. You got a lot to discuss, a lot to talk about. Um, a lot of interesting stuff has happened over the weekend, so I imagine you saw it, so we might as well discuss it. Um, but before we get started on that, I want to make sure I remind you guys, as always, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast, make sure you never miss an episode, make sure you're always on top of when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could please as well, wherever you listen to your podcast, give us a five star rating. Our nice with you, it'd be very appreciated, very helpful, I'll see what you guys like, what you guys dislike, the ways you can improve, all that fun stuff, and also, if you're on social media, we are on social media, so you can find us there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss, and I tried to tell you people, I did, I've told you guys a lot, obviously, something's right, something's wrong, it happens, we're all human here, but I tried to tell you guys how interesting this race for the eighth seed in the West was going to be. And I talked about it basically every episode because every episode, it just gets more and more interesting. Um, We did officially have some eliminations um, as of Sunday, which is unfortunate for those teams, but the, the Kings were officially eliminated and the Pelicans were officially eliminated from contention for that eighth seed, which is unfortunate because of the fact that, again, the Pelicans were, whether they say it or not, were the reason why the NBA decided to do this in general. But it seems like once Zion left the bubble, which was personal reasons, I don't know exactly what he went through. It is what it is. Like, that's more important than basketball at the end of the day. It's just unfortunate of the timing of it. Um, But once that happened and it was clear that whatever work he had put in in the time off had been somewhat undone, which is, again, kind of crazy seeing as it was only like a week he was gone, something like that, uh, maybe a little bit more. But it wasn't like a long, it wasn't like a month that he was he was out, obviously. It was, it was like a week, maybe a little bit more after he had been practicing for a little bit. Um, it was unfortunate that he was never able to get back to that, whatever that the, the pre-leaving, uh, I guess, stamina or the pre-leaving body, whatever you want to call it, that he was at. Was never able to get back to that, and then obviously he's put on a miss restriction and all that foolishness, and then um, they, uh, so then obviously that hurt the Pelicans. It cost them some games, especially maybe early that first game against the Jazz. Maybe if he's in there, they win that game, and then things go a little bit differently um, over the course of this restart. But I mean, they played him a lot today. Well, they played him more today. Let me not say a lot. Um, they played him more today. I'm trying to they they played the Spurs earlier in what turned out to be an elimination game. Um, due to the fact that the Blazers ended up winning in their game against the Sixers, even though that took a lot of a lot of help from Dame and the fact that Embiid got hurt. Um, but yeah, Zion played 27 minutes, which is more than he had been playing. So there is that. Um, but it still wasn't enough. They weren't able to come, overcome DeMar DeRozan, especially in the fourth. Um, he had 27 for the game, I think like 14, something like that. 13, 14, somewhere around. Maybe it might have even been 16. Um but yeah, he had um he had a good uh a good fourth quarter. Uh Jonte Murray had eighteen. Derek White, who left early in the th- early in the second half, he had sixteen. Rudy had nineteen off the bench and a and a somewhat key block, you could argue. Um, I believe it was a block on a on a uh Zion layup near the end of that game. He had fourteen in the fourth. Uh, DeMar DeRozan did. Sorry to go back to that real quick. But, 
Um, yeah, yeah, that block on the layup late in the game, that kind of, I think they were down like five or seven, the Pelicans were at the time, and that basically all but sealed it, that they weren't going to officially come back. So, unfortunate for them, unfortunate for the Kings, who were also eliminated today, they lost to the, lost to the Rockets in their game earlier on Sunday. Uh, they were up big early, if I remember correctly, yeah, they got off to like a good start, especially in the first quarter. They came out, um, they came out and had a 13 point lead after one, and then they were down at halftime. So, there's that. Um, apparently, this was the Austin Rivers game. We've been seeing a lot of, like, oh, this is the such and such game. Um, in the industry of Restart, because a lot of guys are playing very well. Um, some of them, I tried to hit you guys on early. Michael Porter Jr. was another one. Um, I said that if he got some more minutes, he could, he could put, put on, he could be, could provide, a lot of offense for that team, and that's what he's been doing in with his more minutes. So that's helped the Nuggets a little bit, kind of maintain that that three seed at the very least for the time being. Um, obviously, I was wrong about Lonzo says that, um, but yeah, like you had like again T.J. Warren's going off. You have random guys here or there that just happen to have big games. And tonight was the Austin Rivers night. Um, he had 41, 14 and twenty from the field. Um, only shot eight free throws. Hit. Six threes, all off the bench, mind you. Granted, he played 33 minutes, so those are starter minutes. But he came off the bench, so still impressive. Um, four assists, six rebounds, just for good measure. And yeah, the Kings, I mean, the Rockets won by 17. And yeah, that all but eliminated the Kings. And also, it allowed the Rockets to now have a full one-game lead on the five seed, who's the Thunder at the moment, for that um, four seed. Again, it doesn't really matter. Like home court is whatever. Um, but seeing as, I mean, there is no home court. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just want to ideally have the higher seed. That just seems like you, the, you just like, I mean, just like a thing. Most people try to strive to get as high as possible, get as many wins as you possibly can get. Um, we'll see how the, the Rockets play it the rest of these games. They got three games left. Um, Spurs Tuesday, Pacers Wednesday, and then Rocket, uh, the Sixers on Friday. Excuse me. So we'll see how many more games they they have guys playing. I know Russ. I don't think Russ played tonight. Again, yeah, I think that's back to back games. He's been out. Um, Eric Gordon's still out. So we'll see. We'll see if and when those guys come back before the playoffs start. Well, Russ will probably be back for the for, for the playoffs. I don't know about Eric Gordon per se, but see if any of those guys come back before then. See if they rest James any games. Just to, you know, kind of just hey, you've done a lot. Um, we'll just give you a night off here, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, what else happened in the West? Oh, the, the, like I said, the Blazers, um, they had a big game, got a big win for them. Dame had 51 in that game. Now, Dame had a very eventful weekend. Let me, let me say that. Cause the day before they played the Clippers, right? He had a shot late to, to, I think it was, I'm trying to remember if that was to put them up with the two free throws or if that was the tie. Hold on. I'm, I'm going to go back in the play by play here. To make sure I got it right for you guys. Um, so, okay. So, dang. When did he get this free throws? Oh, yeah. So, this was two. They were down one at the time. He missed two free throws um, that could have put them up. Uh, then Jamarco Green came down, hit two free throws. Then he missed a three, a step back three. It was a good shot for him um, because uh, he can hit those kind of shots. He missed them. He missed it. It is what it is. It happens sometimes. You sometimes you make them, sometimes you miss. Um, no, no big deal in that regard. Um, but then the yeah, Blazers end up losing. But in that game, I think he, he hit somebody with a step back uh, three, like earlier in the game, and he like said something to Patrick Beverly, like, like I want you out here. It should be you out here because like, obviously to the point of like this guy can't guard me. And also, I guess a lot of people like going at Patrick Beverly because he's annoying, and I as a non fan of the teams he's been on. Um, I definitely would agree with that. I know Russ made the point of like, he, I think it was earlier this year. He said this about him was that he, he was like, he tricks y'all. He just like runs around a lot. He's not really like, a lot of people think he's like, Oh, we're a really good defender or like very scrappy, uh, brings out energy to the team, things like that. And he just kind of strikes you as a player that like you would hate if he was on like every other team, but like you like, if he's on, like you can like, yeah, I, I don't know about... I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but, like, you can accept if he's on your team. Just like, hey, he's going to annoy some people, he's going to tick some people off. 
get under people's skin, but like sometimes it'll work. Um, so yeah, this is kind of just the kind of guy he is. Um, so yes, yeah, so then that was, so he said that. And then I think once he missed, I don't forget if it was missing when he missed the free throws or when he missed the, it might be when he missed the free throws or when it was either when he missed the free throws or when he missed the three. Um, him and, um, the Morris from the Clippers. I think Marcus, I mean, they, you could be either one. They could interchange jerseys. I mean, they're in the bubble. No one would know. Um, but yeah, so he, he was kind of mocking the whole Dame time thing because obviously, um, it was not Dame time as he did not hit the clutch shots. Um, and I think, and I, and I think Paul George has something after in his like post game situation about, I don't know if Dame heard those comments before or after he went to his media session, but they asked him about, Okay, and also I know he did Patrick Beverly not to kind of hop around in ideas, but um, Patrick Beverly did like his like wave that he did to the Thunder, which still is etched in my brain. It still hurts. Um, but the wave he did in the Thunder after he hit the three over Paul George, apparently Patrick Beverly did that to him as they were walking off the court, which is like weird because like this game doesn't really like mean anything, and like he didn't play. But again, this is who Patrick Beverly is. He's an annoying guy. Um, if you're not on his team, so he did that, and so he was kind of somebody asked him about it. He was going back and forth, and he, and he was just kind of saying, um, he he was saying something more, basically along the lines of, "I don't." You you look up the video to get the official word for word. I don't remember the official word for word, but basically it was like he took it as a sign of respect because he's not he's knocked him out of the playoffs before. Obviously, he did it in Portland against the Rockets, uh, in that th- or with the three he hit in like I think it was game five in the first round. I'd be forgetting if the first round series are five or seven sometimes. But whatever it was, it was the last game of the first round. No, I think that might have been a game seven. I think they usually do seven, seven, seven. I think baseball's the only one that does like five, seven, seven. Um, but again, could be wrong. Hockey might do that too. Um, but yeah, so he did it regardless. He hit the shot for to, to clinch the series against Houston while he was there. Then he did the same thing to Paul George. Obviously, that was in a game five. They were up 3-1. It was, the circumstances were a little bit different, but the result was still the same. So he was talking about that and how he's he's knocked out guys from that team from the playoffs before, and like he just takes that as a sign of respect because they expect him to hit that shot because they know because they know he can hit that shot because he's done it to them before. That was kind of his point. Um, so it was just like whatever. And then I know Paul George has some things on Instagram about him, um, and then uh, then Dane clapped back and said that like oh he's a chump because he'd be switching from team to team, which eh, you know not wrong. Um, I mean the brother was in OKC. For a year, resigned, and then was and then got the call from Kawhi. And he's like, "All right, yeah, no Kawhi, I'm, I'm like, I'm good here." I'm like, what? I'm like, come on, come on, Paul. Um, but hey, I mean, if Kawhi Leonard calls, you kind of got to answer. I understand, especially after the finals that he had, after the playoff run you just had. I get it. Um, so he did that. Then, like you said, Dame came back. Then, then he was then Paul George came back and said that uh, he was gonna he was not he was gonna knock down the first line anyway, so it doesn't really matter um, what he says because I mean, obviously, this is the last time they're gonna play each other. I'm pretty sure before the before I guess they would meet in like a conference finals due to the fact that where if the Blazers even get into the playoffs they'll be the eighth seed and they'll be on the other side of the bracket so they won't see each other again until next year. Interesting to see how that goes down next year. And then Patrick Beverly chimed in with the Cancun on three, which is obviously the joke. I think that I don't know who officially started, but I know they mentioned it a lot on like NBA talk shows, like um, the like the TNT like the, um, and inside the NBA. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called the like the. Kenny, Ernie, Shaq, uh, Charles, like that's kind of what they say for when people, or the, it was an expression for like when teams were getting ready, like, you know, how you do like the, the huddle and they like one, two, three, like team or one, two, three, like family or warriors or whatever your team name is. And like, that was the one, two, three Cancun is for, or Cancun on three is, um, for when like you're about to, like your season's about to be over basically. So that's, uh, so that, that's what, um. Patrick Bear was saying is that they're about their season's about to be done, so it doesn't even matter. They might not even make the playoffs. So there's that. Then then they got some back and forth between like the, the Dame sister and like Paul George's girl. It got a little bit messy. Um, but yeah, so Dame's had a very eventful weekend. Um, um, but yeah, they needed they needed the win as the Sixers, even though it shouldn't take 124 points and um, 51 from Dame to win that game. Like I said, against an Embiid and Simmons less. Uh, Sixers team, due to the fact they allowed Rick, Josh Richardson to have a great game. He had 34. Even Horford wasn't terrible tonight. They gave, let Alex Burst get 20 off the bench. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a mess for them. But, like I said, that win kept them in the race for the eight. And it was needed because behind them, as we talked about the Spurs, they're, they're right behind them. They're a half game back. 
But a full game back of them is the Suns, who are still the only undefeated team in the bubble. 5-0 and after beating the Heat on Saturday in a, in a nice win for them. Devin Booker, again, doing his thing, 35 points. Shame that people are talking about he shouldn't be on the All-NBA team. It's absurd. Granted, he's probably not going to be on there, and I understand why he wouldn't be. But, like, clearly, um, you can see that he's that caliber of player. So to say that, at least, is is disrespectful. Whether or not he makes it, it is what it is. There's a lot of good guards in the league. Um, but to say he's, like, not even, like, nah, there's no way. Like, no, it's disrespectful to Devin Booker. He's, he's like that. It's just not his fault that... His team, and well, it's not his fault. His best player was like suspended for most of the year. I don't know he missed a lot of games. Kelly Oubre, their the uh, their, their actual second best player, due to the fact that Aiton was out so much, isn't playing or hasn't played in the bubble. Don't know if he's going to be back. I don't think he'll be back. Um, so yeah, like without him, Devin Devin Booker still putting on a show every night, putting on a show. They play again uh, Monday, which will be interesting because Monday has a very impressive slate of games that I advise you all to tune in for, again, if you're a basketball fan. they So so let me just go up, pull up the Monday schedule here for you guys real quick. They got Thunder Suns, big game for both. Uh, the Thunder trying to keep pace and make sure they don't get passed up for that five seed. And the Suns need, to, need a win to make sure uh, they keep pace for the eight seed. And also shout out to their social media team. They've been one of the stars of the bubble as well. Um, you got Mavericks Jazz, a game that, could have some sort of implications due to the fact that I think the the Jazz... No, well, obviously the Jazz haven't won that many games in the bubble. But the Mavs are two games back of them. And the Jazz have two games left. And the Mavs have three in terms of for the sixth seed. So there's a chance. Again, not, not likely. But there is a chance that they could pass them up. Because I think the Mavs have three games left to play. So if that is in fact the case, then they win out. Um, the Jazz lose out, then I'm pretty sure that the Mavs would then be the sixth seed, which again, instead of playing the Clippers, which I wouldn't want if I'm Luka, um, you can now play Denver and shout out to Luka. i put on a phenomenal performance against the Bucks Saturday night. That was an amazing game. Had the between the legs pass, the between leg pocket pass on the on the pick and roll to Maxi Kleber for the M1 dunk, like in overtime. Um, had a what? A, a 19 assist triple double. Again, in overtime, but still. Had 19, triple, uh, 19 assist triple double, 17th of the season. Um, pulled through with 36, 14 rebounds, 19 assists, like I've talked about. So, again, it'll be fun to watch him in the playoffs. The rest of the team, you just hope brothers show up. Like, again, KP's been pretty good, but 99 of 24, 26 points. Like, eh. uh, Fanny Smith was good. Um, hit six threes, 27 points. Um, Kleber had uh, 15 off the bench. So you just need a couple. You need one other guy to show up in the playoffs because Luke is going to do his thing. KP, you would assume, is going to do his thing. Um, you need one other guy to show up for them to at least compete. And I, like I said, I would, if I'm them, I'm trying to avoid the Clippers again. It is what it is. You just make and you just you play whoever you play. But they, the Clippers have a lot of guys that could throw at Luka, and that'll definitely annoy him in his first playoff run. So that'll at least be fun that he'll now be in the playoffs to be a part of that first playoff run for him. At least that should be. Pretty, pretty interesting. So, like I said, um, that's why that game is big. Because it matters three games left against the Jazz, Blazers, and Suns. All games that the, all those teams want to win. You know, if they went out, which, I mean, is not impossible. But uh, the Mavs defense definitely leaves something to be desired. So, those would be three very high-scoring. Well, maybe not the Jazz one because the Jazz offense isn't that good. But, hey, Donovan Mitchell put on a show the other night, too. It's been, like I said, bubble basketball. It's been amazing. Uh, the Went to double overtime, the Nuggets. Jazz, Donovan Mitchell and Jokic battling it out in overtime. It was, and he plus he was great down the stretch. Jamal Murray was great down the stretch, even though he was gassed. Um, down the stretch in the fourth quarter and in the second overtime, if I remember correctly. Yeah, just great basketball all around in the West. And there's, like I said, there's more coming. I, I didn't even finish the schedule um, for the week. That's how excited the the games got me. But yeah, you got Thunder Suns, Mavericks, Jazz, Ra- Raptors, Bucks, um, Pacers, Heat. But we'll talk about we'll talk about why that matchup matters in a second. I uh, will in the next segment, and then Nuggets Lakers, if, assuming the Lakers are trying, which we don't we won't know. But um, I'm saying those are five very fire matchups and five games that all matter. Like these aren't there. There are no games that don't matter. 
on that docket. So it should be a fun day of basketball. First game starts at 2.30, though. It's not on national TV. So, hopefully, well, either you, hopefully you have lead pass or you just go and file like the tweets or updates that, that way because you're not going to be able to see it, um, like I said, without the lead pass. So, I talked about that was the West. We'll switch over to the East and talk about that right after the break. So, stay right there. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. So before we talk about the Pacers Heat matchup, which if everybody plays, I know Jimmy hasn't been playing um, now. Like TJ Warren said, that's questionable. Like no, I want to see the smoke. Um, like I said, because like we'll touch on um, why that why that is a very intriguing matchup in a second. But before I do that, I wanted to give a shout out to the Nets because. No one thought they were going to. I mean, they, I'm not still saying, not saying they're going to beat nobody in the first round of playoffs. None of that. Not going to say that. But there were many people, myself partially included, that thought they might not even win a game during the restart. After a game, you saw people, they were pulling guys off the street. They were pulling guys out of retirement. Some of the guys that got to pull back, they get in Nerona. Michael Beasley, unfortunate for him. Um, but yes, yeah, so he couldn't even participate in the restart. Like I said, they, they've had guys like they've had um, uh, Jared Allen, Joe Harris, Karis Levert uh, miss some miss some time. Um, just be I guess just like rest and management things like that. And yet and still, they are four and two in the bubble. Four wins, and because including their win on Sunday against the Clippers, and again, did the Clippers play everybody? No. But this starting lineup of Karras, Garrett Temple, Jared Allen, Kuroks, and Joe Harris is not that good. Just point blank period is what it is. Like again, at least the the, the Clippers starting five of Reggie Jackson, Shamit, Zubak, Marcus Morris, and Kawhi is is better than that. We that's 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 clear. Plus off the bench, I mean, they didn't have, they didn't have, um, Mont- they still don't have Montrez, because he's going through what he's going through, he'll be back whenever he's back, they rested Paul George, obviously, Patrick Beverly's not playing, so again, do, do they have their full team? No, but Kawhi still played 37 minutes, so it's not like they weren't trying, Lou Will still played, Jermichael Green still played, those are guys that are going to get minutes. In the in the actual postseason, Patrick Patterson might get some minutes in the actual postseason. Well, well, I don't know about him, but Jamal Green and Lou Will are definitely going to get minutes in the postseason. So again, it's not like they played nobody; they didn't have their full team. And yet, and still, the Nets were able to pull off the win by nine, due in part because Karis Avert is starting to show that he could be that third star. And again, we kind of already knew that he's had a good season. His, his biggest thing has just been his injuries. He hasn't been able to stay healthy. But in this restart, in the five games that he's played, he's had over 20 points three times, including a 34-point game against the Wizards, 
and a 22-point game last game against the Kings. Um, he's been a part of three of their wins against the Wizards, Kings, and Clippers, obviously. Um, he's he's had he had 13 assists in this in this game against the against the Clippers, which is big because his ability to handle the ball. And again, once Kyrie and KD are back, they're going to do a lot of the ball handling. But at least it allows you to the ability or the confidence in him for when they're on the bench. All right, we can have Karras out there. He can run the offense and we'll be all right. If he can kind of um, continue to showcase that and improve on that ball handling ability, the passing ability, because that's kind of the next step for a lot of these guys. It's like, all right, I know you can score, but can you play make? And that's kind of why I think um, Devin Booker has continued to ascend to the level that he's at is because of the fact that he's now become more than just a shooter and a scorer. He's like, all right, I can get you six assists a night from the from the two guard, or I can be the main facilitator on offense. Like I can do that now. Like that's not a problem for me. And like I said, I'm not. Karras isn't going to need to do that when you have two um, pretty ball and opening guys on your team. But when they go out of the game, you're going to need somebody to handle the offense. And Karras is at least showing. And he showed him throughout the season. This isn't new. That's why when I talked about the guys that could kind of um, put on their put a show of the star potential. I talked about, I touched on him a little bit, but I was like worried. I'm like, this Nets team isn't that good, which I mean, they're still not, but they play hard, which is half the battle, honestly. And especially down here where not everybody seems to be giving their full effort every night. And the Nets at least are. And like I said, Karras is having himself a good um, bubble. So yeah, so the Nets are four and two, as I mentioned, with wins over the Clippers, the Bucks, two teams that could very well Meet in the finals, and then the Kings and the um, Kings and the Wizards, and I think they lost to the Magic. Yeah, also the Magic and the Celtics. Celtics blew them out. That was bad. Um, but the last two games are against the Magic and the Blazers. Both games they could win, and I'm pretty sure they're locked into the seven seed now too. So I mean, that's the well. Let me take that back about the could win because they might not even need to. They might not gonna have to try. Like, again, if you want to play some guys, you can. But you've already shown enough. You've won enough games to secure yourself the seven seed. So you don't have to play the Bucks Again, you have to play the Raptors. Not any better. Um, at least the Bucks have looked a little bit worse in the, in the restart. You could argue. Again, it is what it is. Um, they knew they were locked into the one seed. So that's not um, how serious they took it is, is you will we'll never know. But again, you just don't have to play the Bucks. That's definitely beneficial because they have no one, absolutely no one to guard Giannis. Don't know what they would do with him. Um, so we'll see. But again, shout out to them for doing their thing that we're starting kind of shocking some people, at least to the degree of, like, them winning games. And then winning games against good teams. Like, they beat the Bucks, whether or not... Like I said, they were up on the Bucks, as we've already discussed, when Giannis and Milton, those guys were playing. Granted, they didn't play in the second half. But in the part of the game that they were playing, the Nets were winning. So you got to give them credit for that. And again, even in this Clippers game, this is not a, this is not a game where anybody penciled them to lose. Um, the Clippers. No matter, again, no matter who sat, unless, unless they sat Kawhi and PG, if one of those guys played, they expected them to win. And they didn't. And it says not like Kawhi sat. Like, they tried to play Kawhi his normal minutes. He played 37. Like, that's, that's basically what he's going to play for in the playoffs, I would imagine, somewhere around there. So, they gave it a shot. Um, but yeah, so that was the interesting one. Um, so now we'll get to this Pacers Heat matchup. So if you weren't aware, or, or just, um, I mean, I don't, if you're not a Heat fan or a Pacers fan, you might have missed this. Or I guess if you're not immersed in NBA Twitter, you might have missed this. But, um, yeah, Jimmy Butler, TJ Warren, got some beef. I think it stems from, basically, there was... I know in the last game they played against each other, the Heat were killing the Pacers. Um, I don't know exactly everything that happened between the two of them in, those, in that game. But I do know that... Jimmy got called for an offensive foul. He pushed off. Clear as day. And um, T.J. Warren got up, and he was, like, clapping, clapping in his face about them, them making a good call. Granted, they were down a lot, so it really didn't matter. Um, but I think it was, like, still, like, the first half of the third quarter or something. So, like, they could have came back. Who knows? But he was he was doing a lot of clapping. And then he ended up getting tossed. And then um, Jimmy Butler blew him a kiss, which was interesting um, decision to make. And then Jimmy Butler talked about him after the game and basically called him sorry and that he was trash and that, like, um, anytime they put him on him, he's going to kill him. Like, that's disrespectful, basically. that like It's, it's kind of like one of those things where, like, when you... This is one situation where, you, where, in your mind, you're better than a guy and, like, like them having the audacity, the unmitigated goal to be like, you think this guy can guard me? 
Like, oh no, like that's I take that personal now. Like, 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 um, like the MJ meme, like what he said in the last dance. Like, it became personal for me. After I forget, I forget what what he said that about. Um, but yeah, like that's that's basically what Jimmy Butler is saying. Like, oh, you think this guy can check me? All right, bet. So you see what I do, and that's again, that's what his post game comments were. Um, centered around just like, hey, look, every time you guys put this guy on me, I'm gonna kill him. So now this is the the next time they're meeting up was this game. So hopefully both guys can play because obviously we get that we get, we get the the reignite that beef, see if it's still there. Um, and also TJ Warren's arguably been the best player in the bubble. Again, you have Devin Booker, you had AD for a few games, he's kind of falling off, he's looking very shaky recently. Um, it's torn in single digits. I mean that's can't be having that. Um, I'm trying to think who else is really, really Michael Porter Jr. has played really well, though not at that same, maybe not at the that same level. Due to the fact that he's not like the like Devin Booker is the number one guy. I'm not sure if TJ Warren's the number one guy per se, but he's been their number one offensive scorer. Um, but yeah, no, Michael Porter Jr. is playing well. Um, I'm trying to think is there anybody else. Uh, really, that's like head and shoulders above anybody. No, it was probably like I think that, that's probably like a solid three. Again, you know, I may have missed some guys, so you can, you're more than welcome to throw anybody else in there. But, like I said, TJ Warren coming off a great game on Saturday again, which, I mean, is a, too, is a shock to no one at this point. He beat the Lakers. Um, I think he had, what, like 18 in the first and finished the game with 39 points with a couple daggers, um, and some of them over Anthony Davis, who is a defensive player of the year candidate. We'll talk about those award finals in, in later on in the show. Um I mean, it's a no slouches. Like, they played LeBron. They played AD. Like, they weren't... It's not like the Lakers were giving up the game. They played their starters. They're the guys who were going to play in the playoffs. Just didn't go that well for them. Um, So, there's that. Um, but, yeah, so TJ Warren's been phenomenal. The Pacers... Like I said, they, um, the Pacers have are 4-1 and one, have only lost to the Suns. Which, I mean, again, Suns are 5-0, so that makes sense. Um, And also... The Heat play them twice. So the Heat and Pacers play twice with the Pacers playing the Rockets in the middle. I think the Heat play the Thunder in the middle. If I am correct on that, yeah, they play the Thunder in the middle. Um, and these games are important because right now the Heat are the four and the Pacers are the five. And they're tied. So again, whoever wins this game is now up. In the standings, and is now the four seed again. It doesn't really matter because there's no home court, but again, still, you would just prefer that. And also, I guess it depends on if you want to be in the Raptors bracket or you want to be in the Clippers bracket. I mean, not the Clippers, the Bucks bracket. Um, if that's the thing that you care about, it was a big game for that, big game for seeding, and then also you get to see you have to also potentially avoid playing the Sixers. Which, I mean, Embiid got, went out today with the injury. Simmons needs surgery. I'm just going to have to leave the bubble for that. You don't have to quarantine for a while. Don't I mean, his season's basically done. Unless they go like and get to the Western, I mean, Eastern Conference Finals. Which, I mean, we'll see how bad this ankle injury that kept uh, Embiid out, of the, out for the rest of the game is. To see if they even get that far. Because they might not even get that far. But I guess if they do, then Simmons could come back. But, I mean, we... Like I said, we will they'll cross that bridge when they get there. Get out of the first round first. And then we'll worry about if Sims can come back. So, like I said, it's just a big game. And then, like, on top of the fact that they have two games left in the regular season, and things hold, and they say they have the four and five spot, because they're both, well, they're, since they're tied, they're a game up on the Sixers for the for that four or five seed. You could potentially get a whole playoff series of this. With Jimmy Butler, TJ Warren back and forth. And just to see, like, is that Hotry going to continue? And I think TJ Warren... Among other players. Um, but T.J. Warren is an interesting case study into the philosophy or the psychology of athletes and that some guys perform better in front of a crowd and some guys perform worse. Because, like, obviously we knew T.J. Warren could score. That's not anything new. But, I mean, the display he's, he's put on in these, in these uh, games has been nothing short of sensational. I mean, all, in all honesty. Um, like I said, the first game he had what, uh, fifty three. Yeah, yeah fifty three against the Sixers. Followed up with thirty four against the Wizards, thirty two against the Magic. His only bad game was against the Suns. Interestingly enough, he only had sixteen. 
Then you have 39 against the Lakers. So he's been great. And again, not to say that he, he he's a shooter, he's a scorer, so sometimes you can just get hot. You can be on a hot streak and get that going. But it, but it's like, be interesting to see just like, hey, is he kind of a guy that like raises his game up? Or is just like, you know, some guys are like really good in practice, but then we put him out there. Or just even like when it comes to certain aspects, like maybe they're a good three-point shooter in practice, they're a good free-throw shooter in practice, and all of a sudden you got fans out there, now they can't hit a shot. Because now they're nervous or they're worried or whatever. Maybe. Like I said, this, it'd be interesting to kind of just delve into that further. I'm not a, like, psychology person. Um, so, or like a sports psychologist or whatever, to kind of do a, do a more detailed study on that. But that's interesting, the thing to look into. And how that could potentially affect these bubbles and these playoffs. That's why I've been talking about how, like, again, you have the teams at the top that should make it. But that whole, this whole, you know, normally, like, oh, role players play better at home thing. There's no home. Everyone's everyone's home. You're 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 playing where you're going to be at. So that's kind of maybe that's the TJ Warren thing. We're like, all right, like he's a guy that maybe plays better on the road than at home. I don't know the Pacers' um, stats like that. I don't know his stats like that. But if that was the case for him, now like I said, he's just in the gym. Like this is just where he's going to be at. So he doesn't have to worry about opposing fans. That doesn't have to worry about heckling or booing or um, fans like rooting against you things like that. He doesn't have to worry about. It. He can just go out and just hoop. And like I said, for some guys, that's that's good for some guys. They need the crowd to feed off. That's kind of what they do. They get the, them getting riled up or them pushing to make the crowd mad at them for playing so well is kind of what fuels them. So that's an interesting kind of dynamic to look into when it comes to these athletes and how this bubble and how these playoffs are going are gonna to work. Because, like I said, uh, there's no home court. So a lot of these guys that maybe are good practice players are going to be good in the playoffs because, hey, it's just it's no different than practice, really, just against a different team. And obviously, and obviously, you know the games matter more, but you know, the atmosphere itself is not that much different. So that's interesting to kind of delve into. So hopefully everybody plays in those games. Uh, I want to see that because that'll be quite a fun one. And like I mentioned, the Embiid injury, we'll see how serious that is because then if he's out for the playoffs, I mean, no one's going to expect him to get out the first round if they play the – it doesn't matter who they play, Celtics, Pacers – he no one's gonna expect him to get out the first round. Maybe, hey, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Who knows? As I said, the Nets have won four games with the makeshift roster, so anything is possible. But um, uh, yeah, see about that. Also, shout out to the Bucks for finally. Um, I'm not gonna say finally waking up because um, that's disrespectful. No oh, wait, when was the game? Or was that on Thursday? The yeah, I know they lost to the they lost to the Mavs. Maybe that was Thursday. It was Thursday. The, okay, sorry to talk about that. The the game where they um, flipped the switch on the Heat in the second half. And we're like, hey, we're still the Bucks. Um, so don't forget that. But then, like I said, they reverted back to being the Bucks of the bubble against the Mavs. So it is what it is. Um, but yeah. Like I said, we've got a week left. I think there's games through Friday. Then we have to play in tournament. We'll play in games Saturday and then potentially Monday if it goes to that point. And then we got playoff basketball. So it should be fun. It should be interesting. And it'll kind of see how all these games play out over this last week. How these races go down to the wire. How basically up until the last day we're going to be trying to figure out seating and determining who's going to be in, who's going to be out, who's going to be where. Um, all that fun stuff. So keep your eye on that. It'll be a fun one. Like I said, if you're if you got the time tomorrow, sit in front of a TV, watch them these games. Because they should be pretty good. Granted, I'm not a psychic. I don't know for certain that they're going to be good. But the matchups are good. And a lot of these games in the bubble have been good. So I'd be shocked if we didn't have at least a couple of good games out of this slate. Yeah, I mean, if we, like I said, if we have all of them are good, that also wouldn't shock me either. If all of them are bad, that, that's the only thing that would shock me. But, again, if you just look at the matchups from Monday, there there's not a bad matchup in the bunch. Not a one. So, should be interessante. And speaking of interesting, um, yeah. College football in an interesting spot right now um, because it's it's the season's basically in shambles at the moment. Um, so we'll talk about how they got there, uh, what 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 they're dealing with, the NCAA is dealing with, what the players are dealing with, um, what the players are saying, what the players are doing, uh, and all that fun stuff right after the break. So stay right there. Hey. 
Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA-podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G- smcpodcast.com for more info. Podcast network. So there's been a lot of buzz. Well, there was a lot of buzz Sunday. Especially Sunday night. You saw tweets from players. You saw talks to meetings and gatherings and discussions amongst the top people in all the, in all the conferences. Well, all the Power 5 conferences. You had the MAC um, already deciding they're, they're like, nah, we're not having football this year. Obviously, we know about the Ivy League. We know about the different um, conferences going to different schedulings um, for their season. Mainly, a lot of them mainly uh, conference only. With some divisions obviously going, uh, maybe one out of conference game here or there. Obviously, we have the, the different player coalitions with the uh, Pac-12 and the Big Ten doing their like United, um, we are United stuff, and trying to again make sure that everything's right on the players' end, um, so that when they're out there on the field, they are make make sure that's safe, and that the NCAA is doing right by them as opposed to just doing what's best for the NCAA. And that is to make money. Um, but with that being said, this is according to Sports Illustrated. This came out late uh, Sunday night. But sources, Power 5 Comps is moving toward canceling fall sports. Obviously, I mean, again, all fall sports are kind of up in the air as a whole. But obviously, the big money maker is the football. So that's why. I'm talking about that a little bit more. But yeah, I would I would have been shocked, if any. Um, like I said, if... if, if if any sport other than football was even going to be, try to be played this year, I don't even know how it was going to work. And again, the finances of it with the, the testing and 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 everything that that, it, that is going to cost. I think that was the reason why the MAC was ended up canceling was just because it was going to be too costly to to test everybody every day or every other day, whatever the process was going to be, and make sure everything was like sanitized and do always make, put on all these extra measures. For to make sure that the season could be done safely, which is what they should be doing. But I guess I thought that was at least from what I'd seen one of the reasons why they decided it just was it was just too costly for them. Again, the Power Five conferences have different money than the MAC has, but still, sentiment is still the same. This is like I said from Sports Illustrated: high-level conference meetings are being planned for this week across the college football landscape, with the expected resolution of postponing fall sports until 2021. Multiple sources have told Sports Illustrated. We've gotten to a critical stage. One conference commissioner told Sports Illustrated Sunday after a conference call between the heads of the Power Five conferences. I think all of us will be meeting with our boards in the coming days. We have work to do that is no fun. Dominoes started falling in earnest Saturday when the Mid America Mid American Conference, excuse me, postponed fall sports. The Big Ten followed with an announcement that it was pausing its scheduled progression to full pad full pads football practices. It will play source Told Sports Illustrated Saturday, I think by the end of the week, the fall sports will be postponed in all conferences. Sounds like we're moving towards that now. Even the timetable might be accelerated. Even that timetable, excuse me, might be accelerated. Sources told Sports Illustrated on Sunday that the Big Ten is moving toward the decision to cancel the 2020 fall season while engaging other power conferences on a uniform decision to be announced later this week. A group of, a group of five league representatives simultaneously were conferring to align their own timelines, the source said. Both the Pac-12 and the Big 12 have calls with league presidents on Tuesday on Tuesday night that may present the first scheduled opportunity for Power 5 leagues to formally vote on postponement, but other calls could be scheduled earlier. A Big 10 president's 
call to discuss the season has was planned for Sunday night. Um, Social Jay confirmed Conference USA had a call previously scheduled for Wednesday, but that has been moved up. Sources said some belt presidents have regularly have a regularly regularly scheduled Tuesday morning mini- meeting, as do AAC athletic directors. The move toward halting the season comes as as a jarring about face after leagues spent most of the last week finalizing football schedule models and slash or releasing schedules. That is a fair point. It seems like nothing's really changed between now and then. But hey, um, oh, then I guess the Big Ten thing came about. So there is that. Um, any momentum toward playing those games was abruptly halted by the match decision. Also that too. Um, <laughs> decision to postpone citing health and safety concerns for ath- athletics amid the co- COVID-19 pandemic. That's at a precedent that the other nine football subdivision conferences were compelled to follow and quickly. In the next 72 hours, college football is going to come to a complete stop. One industry source said. So, um, yeah, this is not good. Not what any college football fan, college football fan, excuse me, wanted to hear. But it's a scenario that is un, well, not gonna say unshocking, but unsurprising to me. Only because, as I've said throughout all of this, um, playing a season means multiple things. Well, I mean, there's a couple of different reasons for why there's a season that would take place. Um, First and foremost, that means that college football is no longer an amateur sport. That, because that's basically what you're saying is the only things that are being, obviously, there's like high school and different things. But again, most high schools, you, you don't you want to travel. And even that's going to be a little shaky because um, um, schools, I know the one school that kind of went viral on Twitter, because there was a picture of, like, the crowded hallway. Um, I think it was a high school for their first day. Even though I think the the girl, she was on, like, some morning talk show. So I think she got suspended for that, which, I mean, is outrageous. But from the school standpoint, I know why they suspended her in terms of, like, they don't want that bad press out there. Um, but also now they have, like, six positive students and three positive faculty members. So, and I think I think they're, like, stopping or, or shutting down for, like, a couple of days. And, again, they were in school for, like, less than a week. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so then, because the only, the only sports that are really, I think, going to be completed this year are, are like, professional sports. 100% professional sports. Like, again, we already saw what happens with the women's soccer league. That's going to be completed. Well, that was completed. Um, I think the NBA, the, any sport, a bubble, NBA, NHL, um, WNBA, those are all going to be completed, in my opinion. Um, MLB. There are different guys are doing their best not to make, not to have it complete. We'll talk about that in in a little bit. But that one's going to look a little dicey. And NFLs, who honestly, who knows? Who knows really? Because their situation is just like the MLB situation where you you got guys traveling, you got guys in different markets doing different things, um, and you kind of just all relying on the players to do everything. And obviously, putting in place in place penalties and different things for what, if they were to break some sort of protocol. Um, but still, at the end of the day, it's they leaving it up to the players. That's why the bubbles are good because there's there's nothing left up to the players. Like they can't. I mean, obviously, they, they technically they could go out in the bubble and like do whatever they wanted. But then again, you would have to quarantine for ten days, which I don't think anybody would want because that would hurt your team. Different things. Um, but uh, yeah, so it just like that that that's why the bubbles make the most sense. But there was also, as you discussed, there's no feasible way, in my opinion, to do a bubble, though. If there was a way, the NFL had six months to think of it, um, and they chose not to. I mean, they literally just figured out the health and safety stuff like right before training camp, like the, like the, like a couple of days before training camp was getting ready to start, and people were supposed to report. They figured out like, oh, okay, like we'll just finalize this health. And like like the fact that that happened like that late, because when you knew when training camp was, it's always late July. That's when people start reporting. You knew that you had all this time to work on stuff, and they still didn't. They still wait till the last minute. It was a mess. Um, but yeah, so like I said, football being, college football being played means that um, you're admitting that it's a, not an amateur sport, in my personal opinion, and the NCAA is not going to do that. At least not yet. They're not going to do that until they have to. Um, and also, it's going to be difficult because a lot of these schools don't have people on campus. So like, how would you say, and also like, again, well, in, on the flip side of this, um, like, how could you say it is safe to play football, but it's not safe to go to class? Like, how could you argue that? 
And I get, I understand the point, like, oh, they're going to be controlled environments, they're going to be testing every day, blah, blah, blah. That's cool. That all sounds great. But, as we saw over the summer, a lot of these, I mean, I don't, I don't know the exact number, what the, the final tally was, but a lot of schools have to shut down workouts because of outbreaks. I say Clemson has one guy that's not playing this year due to complications of stuff, not just the COVID, because obviously the strep throat and other things and him not being able to work out for a majority of the summer, you're leaving him out of shape. Like that, that started, granted, and again, you didn't get the, he got the COVID before he got to campus, which is a good sign for them um, that he didn't catch it there because that'd be worse. But still, that is stopping a player from playing. Like COVID and then what happened after that is stopping a player from playing. Had he not caught the COVID and he just had strep, he probably would have been fine. Uh, okay, yeah, like we talked about, or like I talked about. I, I've had strep before. You miss a couple of days. You're sick for a couple of days. And then, like, relatively soon, you're you're back fine. And at least you can breathe. Like, okay, your throat hurts. That's not fun. And it, like, hurts. But, like, you can still, like, breathe. And your bodily organs, like, work fine. Like, there's no, there's no, like, uh, not that I know of. Again, I'm not a doctor. So correct me if I'm wrong. But you don't get strep and, like, oh... This organ might shut down you. This organ might shut down you. might need this kind of transplant. That. Like, that doesn't happen. As opposed to with that Rona. That's a possibility. Again, not everybody. Everybody's affected differently. But, uh, again, as we saw with the Red Sox pitcher, um, the hard issue he's have, he's, he is having is causing him to miss that season. Um, so, and again, I don't know if it's like a long-term thing. If that's just a short-term thing. I'm not sure. Because, again, not a doctor. But it's, it's bad enough to where he can't pitch this season. So that's me to know, all right, this is a problem that is going to affect athletes. Point blank, period. Or could affect athletes. That's going to. Could. It's like I'm saying, you can't, in my opinion, you can't have no on-person classes and then still say that we're going to have sports without admitting, well, I guess in technically this is all sports, but I mean, most of the sports when you need to play. Football is the one that, that's the moneymaker. So that was the one they were fighting for, in my personal opinion. Um, but they're not just going to say, like, football's going to be canceled. They're saying all fall sports. Because, you know, football's canceled and every fall sport's canceled. Like, that just makes sense. Um, but again, if you're saying that, like, these guys need to be up here, they need to be up, they need to play, then they're not really amateurs. They, they're, like, you're treating them like professionals, but they're not getting paid. So that's a mess. Um, and, but yeah, so you got to deal with that. And also, I guess, like, the flip side someone pointed out is that, like, because some of these coaches are like, oh, or... They they want to keep them up. They want to keep them up there. So it's like also they can like workouts. They can like stay in shape. They can still work on things, do different things, and also like again, as some you know, people were tweeting about. I know Trevor Lawrence kind of mentioned this too. Like oh, if they send them back to their home, like it might be dangerous. Like oh, they might they might get the COVID. They're not getting tested every day. They're not doing. They don't they don't have the incentive to follow the the procedures and be safe and precautious. And I'm like, well, I get that. That's fair. But one, the as we've seen with the MLB, people have all the incentive in the world to not be reckless. And yet, what do, what do you know? Humans are reckless. So, again, just to be like, oh, yeah, if they're up here, like, they'll be fine. Like, no. People were catching it on the campuses when they were working out. The, what's it called? The, the Rutgers. Rutgers had an outbreak, and I think it was partly because of a house party that some of the guys went to. People are still reckless. People are just going to be reckless. That's the That's part of the problem with this whole thing, is that... Due to the fact that a society we have developed where it's very individualistic, everyone's like, all right, I'm going to do what's best for me, whatever that may be. I can care less what happens to you. From and Again, I'm not saying everybody thinks like that, but enough people think like that to where we're in this position we're in now. If we had a more uniform society where it's like, all right, we need to, as a collective group, do this thing together so that we can all be better in a, in a few weeks, months, however long it took then we wouldn't potentially be in the situation right now. You're seeing Australia, I think, had a had 100 days without, like, a community outbreak or something. You got, you're got you seeing other countries have sports back, and now they can't have fans there. They're doing, they're going back to normal life, different things like that. And yet, um, like I said, in America, we we're still trying to decide if people are even going to go to school. And, and if sports can even be played. Like I said, it's a whole mess. Um... But yeah, so there's a good chance we're not going to have college football this season. Very, At least that's what it sounds like. Uh, well, hopefully, I mean, I'm sorry, hopefully that's not true, but like it sounds like it's going to be true. So we'll see. 
Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at now. It is a very, I hope that you weren't looking forward to college football because you might have to find something else to do with your Saturdays. Though, that might benefit the NFL because if they, because again, they're going to play. It is like, they're going to try until they, until they have to stop it. And I don't know what's going to take them to stop it. Because again, it's different than the MLB as opposed to where the NFL misses games. I don't know how they're going to make them up unless like the teams have the same bye week or something. You could do it there. But if that doesn't happen, I'm not really sure how you make it up. Um, but I guess that's on the NFL to figure out because that's their job. But we'll see how that goes. But yeah, at least they would be able to do some things on Saturdays, you would think, and utilize that slot. Because again, now you're just going to have a lot of people free on Saturdays um, with no college football to watch. Like, all right, when we put some NFL games on, kind of switch the schedule up. I don't know if players would go for that because again, now you got shorter weeks and quicker turnarounds for certain games. So I don't think they would want that per se, but it's the thing they're definitely going to try, I would imagine. But yeah, um, quite a bit of a mess. So after we come back here from this next break, we're going to discuss like kind of what all this means and also how the players, whether for better or for worse, are trying to fight this decision and try to make it so that there can be a season and why I think that the NCAA is going so strongly to not have a season. Um, so yeah, we'll discuss all that right after the break. Let's stay right there. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Podcast Network. So, the first thing I wanted to touch on was this Matt Hayes CFB tweet at Matt Hayes CFB, which I assume just means college football. Um, he said, a Power 5 AD just texted. This was Saturday. You and your cause are chasing the wrong story. The virus alone is enough to stop the season. Obviously, we're seeing that, um, potentially. But presidents are terrified of players organizing. It's the paradigm shift to change amateur sports. You, um, this is the second part of that text. You potentially lose one season with the virus. You lose the entire framework of your mission statement with players organizing. They need time to figure out how to attack. Um, and that tweet right there, in my opinion, is why we're at where we're at right now. Because as you're seeing with the Pac-12 players thing, as you're seeing with the Big Ten players thing, um, players are... And this, I mean, again, this is this this is all stemming from a lot of this beginning, at least stem from um, social injustice thing. People um, speaking out about that. Players now realize and see the power that they have. And again, professional players aren't the only ones with the power. College athletes have a lot of the power. They didn't realize it at the time because they were always viewed themselves as amateurs and stuff like that. But this pandemic has allowed them to see that. And I think, I think it's about Monty Jones because he's talked to some guys in the Pac-12 about like how this whole thing came together and how they all started discussing this. And a lot of them were talking about how this pandemic allowed a lot of these guys to compare notes on terms of like, oh, how are you guys practicing? Or what protocols do you guys have in place? Oh, what protocols do you have in place? All right, what protocols does this Big Ten team have in place? What protocols does this SEC team have in place? Again, it allows you to compare notes to just like you have a lot of downtime, you have a lot of free time to kind of just talk about these things with, with guys maybe you wouldn't have had a chance to interact with or communicate with in a normal 
in a normal season or a normal off season. So now, what I think he was talking about, they were like three, four, they were like a lot of Zoom calls, like three, four hundred person text messages, things like that, to be able to, you know, like compare notes, talk, discuss, kind of see like where are we at with this. And I think that's been a problem with the for the NCAA. So you're now seeing the effects of that ability to be able to have these kind of communications to where like players are realizing like, yo, well, well we've been getting shafted for years. And now is the time for us to take some of that power back. And we're seeing like again, like these player coalitions, that's all that's all great. But now what we're seeing is um as we saw, I guess if you saw Trevor Lawrence's tweets, I mean tweets, um and him like Dustin Fields, I mean even the Ohio State tough bowling, I think he put out something like Friday or Saturday, something about that. We kinda of put out a statement like, hey, like what what the Big Ten, like the Big Ten United, like we are United things like that's great. We want to play Ohio State people over here. But like what they're doing is great and we support them. Um so I think what we're seeing now is that well now we'll like and as you saw what Trevor Lawrence tweeted out um later on Sunday night. Now it's two now it's two coalitions are meshing here. Because before, it was all like, oh, once Trevor Lawrence was putting out his tweets, everyone was like, oh, he's a great leader. He's he's um, the guy's kind of guy I want in my locker room. He's kind of guy I want, blah, blah, blah. We need to listen to the players. The players say they want to play. Let them play. Ah, uh-uh. ah. And but Bomani and other people echoed the same sentiment. But Bomani had a funny point was that, like, a lot of things players do and say, everyone's like, I don't want to hear it. And, and again, this doesn't just cause that. But this is just in general. That's like, oh, you're not an athlete. You shouldn't be speaking about this. You shouldn't be speaking about that. You shouldn't be speaking about that. But now, all of a sudden, when it's like, I want to play, it's like, look, see, we need to listen to everything these guys say. They say they want to play. Let them play. But again, when these same athletes are talking about like, oh, we want to talk about these these issues that are going on in society. Like, oh, no, shut up. Don't talk about it. Um, we're not trying to hear it. You're ruining, you're politicizing the sport, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. So it's just, it's just funny how that kind of works. Um, and also again, a lot of these, and even, you know, it doesn't have to be like the political social justice stuff. It can be just as simple as like paying them. A lot of guys like, oh, you guys are paid in free education, blah, blah, blah. Like you don't, like you don't, you shouldn't get any money. Like this is all like, again, you're, you're, you're paid in other ways. But then now when they says like, again, it's just, it's all very hypocritical how when they say certain things that you agree with or you align with, then you're like, oh, we got to hear these guys out. They say they want to play. We got to let them play. They say when well, they want to play, you got to hear them. Um, but then, on, like I said, on the flip side, when they say something you don't align with, you're like, no. Like, you, you try to just attack, 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 and cut down their talking points, which, again, it can't be, you can't be both. It's like either you value the players' opinions or you don't. You can't just value them when they align with what you believe. That's not how any of this works. Again, uh, the good and bad thing about a country like this is that everyone has the free will to say whatever they want. So we are allowed to disagree. You're not necessarily wrong. I'm not necessarily wrong, but we're allowed to disagree. You're allowed to say something. I'm allowed to critique it, vice versa. And criticize it or debate it. But that is what it is. Um, and now social media is heightened that like hundreds of times where now guys can say things behind uh, pictures of dogs and no one will really know who they're, who they're, who they are or who's the one saying it. So you get some uh, level of anonymity um, there. But like I said, the the big issue for the NCAA, and again, why I think they're canceling the season, is because now we're seeing the players come together and ask for things. And I know Trevor Lawrence tweeted this out. Um, it's like this. It's like this um, banner. Well, this graphic um, of like of like five, six talking points. And it has all the Power Five conferences at the top. Has the We Are hashtag We United plus hashtag We Want to Play. So a combination of both, half combination of the, the guys that are like, "Hey, look, what they're doing is great, but I, I want to play football. Let's play football. Let's try to find a way to do that." Got those guys over there. Got the other guys over here. Like, look, we're not playing unless X, Y, and Z are met. They have now come together to formulate a combined group, which is great because that's the big thing. Is that when you see some of these like coalitions or different things, you they kind of like combat one each other, kind of attack one each other. Now they, they they like, like I said, like this guy's over here, and then like the opposite group is over here. Like no, these two sides seem to be working together, which is great for the movement. Um, so in this, in this, I guess you could call it a flyer that they put out. 
And again, he wasn't the only one tweeted. Justin Fields tweeted. Some other guys tweeted. But obviously, Trevor Lawrence is one of, if not the biggest name in college football. So when he talks, guys are going to listen. That's why, again, a lot of his viral tweets about wanting to play and the reasons why he wanted to play and the reasons why he wanted to have play, like he thinks other guys would want to play, um, went viral and like everyone was talking about them. Because, again, Trevor Lawrence is arguably the biggest name in college football right now. Has been for the past three years. And arguably. Um, so, again, people are going to pay attention when he talks. So, in this flyer, he put out that there's like six, they're not bullets, but like six or seven different statements. Um, we all want to play football this season. And I think that's that's the pretty accurate statement all around the board. Even the we are United people that are like standing the, off on the rounds and like, hey, we want to play, but they, we want to make sure these things are met first. So, again, at the end of the day, I don't know. I saw the guys that opted out, obviously. Generally, everybody wants to play. They just don't think it's going to be safe or make any sense to do so. Not everybody does. So that's one. So two, they want to they want to establish universal mandated health and safety protocols and pro, and procedures. I mixed the flip off the words, but you get the same. It's the same point to protect college athletes against COVID nineteen among all conferences throughout the NCAA. So I think that's important, and that's kind of why we're at where we're at as a country. Is not and not everybody is doing the same exact thing. Like we haven't had leadership from the top all the way down. Like this is these are the protocols we're gonna follow. Whether right, wrong, indifferent, whatever. We didn't have anything universal, so now everyone's, they left it up to the states. So now it's like, if things work, cool. It's on the state, I help. But if things don't work, you just, you blame the state, the federal government gets no, I mean, don't, they will get pushback from certain people, but like, they won't get like universal pushback, like, hey, what you did didn't work, kind of thing. You left it up to the states, and then they're they're on their own discretion. Um, So that's why I'm saying that that can't happen, because... In certain places, like I said, like the, the Stanford's, the Madden Clemson's, Alabama's, Ohio State's, the, the big time um, institutions and ones with a lot of money um, can do different things that maybe a smaller school couldn't. Yeah, that's part of the reason why UConn didn't have a football season or wasn't going to have, they canceled their football season just because for them, maybe the financial burden of having to do all this testing and everything coupled with the amount of money they were going to lose was not worth it for them. And maybe they just didn't think it was going to be safe. That's a completely separate point. Um, and that's also possibly true. But again, not everybody may not be meeting. I think that's the point when you kind of would talk about the comparing of the notes. You're like, all right, y'all are doing this, y'all are doing that. I thought that's uh, that's kind of what um, that's what Colorado State was getting in trouble for, potentially. Again, because different people have alleged different things. But that was their problems that, all right, yeah, like you're saying we're doing this. Or like, I think that was a part of their issue. I might be confusing them with another school, but like that was a part of their issue was that like they're your these protocols that we have in place that we're not really following. And that is an issue because again, in theory, everyone should be doing the same thing. You saw some other guys tweeting about oh no, the Colorado State was completely different. That was a racial that was a racial stuff. So big mix up on my part. My bad. Um, like I said, that's a completely uh separate issue. Uh, so maybe I forget I forget what school it was. Um, but there was one school that was having some issues with like, again, protocols and stuff. Might've still been Colorado State. I don't know why I remember that, but uh, Colorado State's obviously doing with race stuff. So I said, might've been wrong about that. Um, but yeah, like I said, back to my point, but my point was that like, you players are able to compare notes and see like, all right, you guys are doing this. You guys have to do that. You guys have to do this. Like, why aren't we doing that? So I think that's the point just to have universal, something universal. So, cause again, um, if Stanford has great stuff. That's good, but if Colorado's protocols aren't up to the same standard, then now you potentially risk Stanford getting infected. I think you're only really as healthy as you. you, I guess like you kind of though you're only as good as your weakest link. You're only as healthy as your worst protocol. So if you have certain people meeting one standard and different people in different universities meeting a different standard, now it's people that meet the top standard are 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 potentially put in harm's way because. Another school they have to play doesn't meet those same standards. It could be, like I said, it could be a big mess there. So that's two. Um, another thing I talked about was give players the opportunity to opt out and respect their decision. Obviously, that's what's been happening, but that, they want that to continue to happen. If players don't feel like they can play or don't want to play, that shouldn't be an issue. Also, with that, guarantee eligibility whether a player chooses to play the season or not. So again, you don't like... Um, so again, if you if you're, say you're a Michael Parsons... Or like one of those guys that we talked about, Rashad Bateman, kind of those guys that have opted out. Like they still get, they, this eligibility still counts. So then like they don't have to come back a, a third year 
for what would have been a first fourth year kind of thing. So they can be free to go go pro. I imagine that that's what that's what that means. Um, and the fifth one is the biggest one in my opinion. Let's use our voices to establish open communication and trust between players and officials. Ultimately, create a college football players association. Because that was one of the big talking points. Was that like, why is this kind of happening? Because the players don't have a union because they are technically not a professional sport. And that was like Ian Rapport tweeted about like, oh, this is why the NFL and the NFLP have done such a good job and why college football is struggling. And I'm like, well, I mean, I guess. But also, like, they don't have a union. Like, that's part of the problem. <laughs> they don't have a union. If they had a union, they wouldn't be in this mess. Because um, they would have been able to communicate and, and discuss these things. So that's kind of what they're pushing for. And that's kind of the big thing and that kind of alludes back to what that text from the, the AD was talking about. Was that, like, all right, if we just happened this season... And didn't have the season because of the pandemic. Cool, that's fine. You Off one year, you can come back. That's cool. But if people are talking about blowing up the very foundation of what the NCAA has built its back on, built all its money on, and now talking about having unions and, and representatives for each conference and player reps and different things, all right, well, now I'm treating like the I'm treating like what it is, and that's a, and that's a professional, and like a, a business and a professional sport, more or less. And that's not what the NCAA doesn't want to do because, again, they've try to pretend it's an amateur sport for years now. I mean, everyone knows it's not. Well, not almost everyone. Most people know that it's not. But then they try to pretend and try to allude to the fact that, like, oh, yeah, no, 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 like, it's amateur. Like, oh, they get the education and whatever, whatever. Like, no, it's a business. And it should be treated like such. And if you're treating things like a business, then a lot of, some, of the, some of the workers, which is what these athletes are, they're workers, have a union to make sure their best interests are represented. And are make sure they're heard and taken into consideration. Because now, again, the, the, basically everything's coming from it may be coming from, from above the eighties. We're talking about like school presidents and lawyers and things like that that are making these decisions. The players' input is going to happen, in my personal opinion. And it's it's a shame that they didn't they didn't do this a little bit earlier because maybe it could have had more of an effect if they would have done this whole hashtag thing a little bit earlier. Because I and, um, I mean you could argue that, but. You saw how it worked last minute with the NFL. I think that's kind of why they kind of like, oh, we should do something like this. But again, they have a union. They have a player association that can rep them on their behalf and kind of discuss these things so you can work through these things a lot quicker. The college football doesn't have that. So that that's the big one. And I think the last the last point was represent a representative of the players of all Power Five conferences. So I imagine it's like one main player rep uh, for each conference. I guess it's in on the meetings, in on the calls, things like that. Um, but yeah, so I think this, that, that right there is what the NCAA did not want to see. And I think that's part of the reason why they're trying to cancel the season. Because if they play the season, they basically have to adhere and meet these standards, which means now the sport is no longer an amateur sport. Which again, it isn't. But now they have to acknowledge that, and they don't want to acknowledge that, so they're like, hey, look, we'll cancel the season, hopefully this will all blow over. And, like, next year, we can come back and everybody will just forget about it. And I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that just because you cancel the season, but it's going to forget about all different things they talk about. Like, no, they're going to be like, let's, like, no, we need to continue to push for this. Continue to push, because, again, these schools, universities, the NCAA, make millions of dollars. Millions. NCAA tournament, I believe, makes billions of dollars on the backs of these athletes that get zero, none of the money. Again, well, they, they get money because, you know, under the table. But, like, they get none of, like, that money. They get none of the legal money. And, again, that's also kind of why they can't get the under the table money because, well, that's why they do get the under the table money because they're like, hey, look, like, this isn't right that I don't get any of this cut. So people are like, you know what? That, that's right. We'll, we'll slip you something on the side. But the NCAA is like, oh, we're an amateur sport. You shouldn't be doing that. But I'm like, if you just paid the players, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, the coaches, they make millions of dollars, get big bonuses, big raises on the backs of these players. Who, again, not, not, uh, coaches are an important aspect of it. But at the end of the day, you're only as good, like like bad players can't, over, good players can overcome bad coach. I think that's what... Um, um, I think that's what uh, Belichick said, something along those lines. At the end of the day, like the players are the ones out there playing. Like, they can, 
if like no matter how good they are or how bad they are, they're the ones out there on the field. They're, they're kind of it all comes down to them at the end of the day. You can you can prep them up, you can prepare them, tell them everything you know. You can say like, all right, this is going to happen here, this is going to happen there. Then make the plays. Um, it doesn't matter if they do make the plays, and that's what matters. It's kind of the things. And again, coaching and players go hand in hand, but at the same time, at the end of the day, it's about the. It's not about the X's and O's, or that's another thing. I passed probably the Belichick one part doesn't work that well, but it's not about the X's and O's. It's about the Jimmys and the Joes. That's an old football um, saying, and it's true. Like again, at the end of the day, it all comes down to players on the field. And like I said, if they're not good, then the coach doesn't as good, and he doesn't get the raises, and he doesn't get all the big money and everything. So. Like I said, um, it's interesting to see kind of what happens with this, all the, these talks and whatever goes down. Well, these calls between the um, the um, like the big wigs at all these power five conferences. Because what they decide, cause I, I, again, at this point, I think it's going to get canceled, and that's kind of my, my position. It just there's no way you can say that it's not safe to have classes, but it's safe to play football without again admitting that it's a professional sport. If you want to do that, then all right, then maybe we can work something out. But if you're not going to do that, which doesn't sound like they want to do at this moment, then yeah, you can't. But there's not much really you can do in regards to uh, the season being played, in my personal opinion. But hey, we'll see. I'm not, again, I'm right about something, not right about everything. So we'll see what happens with that. But shout out to the players. So at the end of the day, whether whether you're on the we want to play side or you want to go on the we're united, we're not playing unless these agreements are met side. Them coming together is big for the future of college sports. And again, I think then I think it was like Caleb Von Chase. I he tweeted out something that like he wants like this sort of representation thing like that for all sports. He doesn't want it just like obviously football is the biggest one, but like this is a this is a situation that like all right, I know a lot of people are like oh, football players should get played or basketball players should get played or whatever. But like I'm not the only athletics or they're not the only athletes at these schools. Other athletes are there too, so they should again um, get the same sort of. Uh, they should have the same sort of basic necessities and, and again, like representatives, um, things like that, that the football players, basketball players, the, the, the money makers you could argue, um, have as well. So we'll see how that goes, but I think it's great. I think it's, again, it's kind of officially putting a bow on the NCAA as we know it, which is good because it needed to be blown up and it's a shame it took a pandemic for it to happen, but Hey, if not now, then I don't know when they were ever going to do it. So hopefully, they can use this time, use these discussions that they've had, use the groundwork they've laid in order to build upon this and don't just like, again, don't just like let it die out in a year. They don't just let all this hard work and all this discussions and all these calls and all these text messages and all this work be for not. Like, let it let it be meaningful. Not, and whether or not it affects you, it affects your teammates, or affects like your little brother, your little sister... Um, your little cousin, your your family in the future, like any kids you may have come through the NCAA playing college sports, whoever it may help, just like like I think it'll be great regardless. So hopefully they are able to get what they deserve, and that is proper compensation, compensation and representation. Because again, at the end of the day, these aren't amateur sports. At least the, at least the big ones aren't amateur sports, in my opinion. But yeah, it'd be interesting to follow. And speaking of interesting. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the MLB right now, and the NHL as well. I'm not. Um, shout out to the Flyers for going from fourth to first in the Eastern Conference. They came to the round round tournament fourth, ended up first. So that makes sense. again no home court. I mean, getting the one seed is great. Um, there's no home court, so or home ice, so it is what it is. Um, but yeah, shout out to them. Thought that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, MLB got um, brawls. You got uh, young players putting the league on notice. And you got surprise teams at the top of the standings in some of these divisions. So we'll talk about all that stuff right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, 
the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Podcast Network. So, I figured. Uh, I mean, it was the one of the more buzzworthy things from the MLB world today, and that was the brawl between the Houston Astros and the Oakland Athletics. Now, this is the second brawl the Astros have been involved in. Now, um, the first one involved the Dodgers and Joe Kelly threw behind a couple guys. I um, remember that wasn't really a brawl; it was more of a. Uh, I don't know, it wasn't even like a tussle, like they, they didn't even, they were just like some little pushing, there was no like, I'm trying to remember, because I know like, because like him and Correa got into it after he struck him out, um, because he like made the, mm, like pouty face, that was kind of, those memes from that were kind of funny, um, that face was pretty funny too, um, just again, continue to show how much people dislike the Astros, and we'll continue to dislike them, it's gonna go, I might, I don't know if it's ever gonna end, but it's definitely gonna be bad for at least this season, um, because if the fans are gonna be there to heckle, or deal with them, or heckle them, do whatever, um, the players are definitely going to put in th- um, their own effort to make sure that they r- make sure that they know that people didn't forget. Um, I mean, I imagine the Astros know that, but again, you, you kind of you sometimes just got to reinforce some things. Um, so yeah, that was the first one. Them and the Dodgers got into it. Uh, Kelly was, I think, suspended eight games, which was kind of already appealed. I don't, I don't, I forget if words ever come down on that, but I know he appealed because eight games was a lot. No, that's fair. That's like what? That's a majority. It's almost like a quarter. That's almost like twenty percent of the season. Just gone. I think, I think they said that in a 62 game season, he was out to like a 22 game suspension, which obviously would have never happened. Um, so yeah, you kind of got to factor in the season amount when you, when you do these, um, when you do these, uh, suspensions due to the fact that again, the season is not much shorter now. So each game is worth that much more in terms of like the totality of it. Yes, yeah, so this, this is a new one. This was a different one. Um, and this one was between, Ramon, I don't want to pronounce his name wrong, but Liriano, I hope I pronounced this right, um, he was hit once earlier in the game, was not necessarily happy about it, um, and then he got hit again a second time, was not happy about that either, did that mean, and he was like, it was funny because he was like, you're trying to tell the guy, like, bro, like, you're supposed to, like, you're supposed to do this with your wrist. Like, when you, I saw you trying to throw, like, a knuckle curve or whatever you're trying to throw. And he was like, you gotta, you gotta snap it. You gotta snap it. Because I'm not trying, like, because it didn't really, clearly it didn't spin properly. And that's why he ended up getting hit in the back. Um, but that, that, would, that was funny. Uh, just because he was trying to tell him how to pitch. And obviously he's not a pitcher. Um, but, yes, then he was going back and forth with the pitcher. Honestly, again, I don't know if it was, I would doubt it was intentional. Per se, but I think that guy just like lost control of an off speed pitch. But hey, you never every every player feels a little different, especially when you got it for two when you get it more than once in the game. It's like, all right, come on, like why y'all only got bad um, location when I'm up? And it's um it's fair to question by then I think. So I was walking up the first baseline. One of the things like the hitting coach or one of the coaches is, like jarring at him. He's saying stuff to him while I was walking up, and then like they say stuff back and forth. Then you see from the one angle, the guy's like, oh, like the Houston Astros goes like, oh, like bring it on, like like he wants to fight. And then, and my and Leon's like, "Where? That's that's what we're about to do." And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, no, bring it on." And then like Leon charges at him, and then the coach is like, "Oh, I didn't know you were serious." So like, so like all the coaches like jumping from him. He kind of like that was the funniest part. Like normally, when you see people like charge him out, like again, like when people like charge him out, like yeah, the pitcher doesn't really like um, necessarily have anybody in front of him, but he doesn't also get out of the way. Like he's like, "All right, this is what we're doing. This is what we're going to do." The the coach was like, "I want to do this," but then also like. I'm not gonna fight that hard to get around the coaches, um, so they're just gonna let you. They're just gonna tackle you, and then you're gonna look like an idiot. And I'm gonna be cool because I'm not gonna get touched. Um, so yeah, that was. It's really absolutely interesting to see what comes out of that 
Um, because again, the coach really did a lot of the instigating. Obviously, Loriano did the talking with the pitcher, but like in terms of that part of it, because it could have just ended there. It seemed like everything was kind of calmed down more or less, and then like obviously the coach did something, and then he ended up charging at him. Because again, he clearly didn't like whatever disrespect he felt he was getting from the coach. Um, but yeah, I imagine the coach should get in more trouble, in my opinion, on him because he's the one that that was egging it on and kind of like instigating it. As opposed to, like I said, it's not like just Liriano just went in charge and started throwing punches. Like, no, it was like the coach. And then again, everyone's, there's different levels of culpability in this incident. But, like I said, second one, the Ashes are involved with. Um, and it's just like, it'd be interesting to see like how many more of these things they got to deal with. Because that was kind of uh, Manfred's worry was that this kind of thing was going to happen like every, every series. And it hasn't happened that often, but... Like I said, I don't know. I don't think this is gonna be the last time it happens. More like what, like a third into the season, something like that, like sixteen games around there. Because so I would doubt that this would be the last time this kind of thing would happen to them. Um, so yeah, just so you'd, something to be mindful of, just something to pay attention to how those suspensions are levied down. See if Memphis learned from the last one, where the Joe Kelly one was probably too strong. And even though, again, I get I get his point for it being that strong because you want to make sure you dissuade people from doing stuff like this. But at the same time, you can't just, like, completely be outrageous when... And then just going to look bad in comparison to what you did to the Astros. Because, again, only people that got in trouble were people that are not with the team anymore. They didn't get no title stripped. And, like, guys got fired or whatever. But, like, none of the players got hurt when they're the ones that are doing it. AJ Hinch, like, tried to stop it. I mean, did, did, did he try his hardest, hardest? Maybe, maybe not. But he did, like, break some things, did some things to try to get, like, hey, guys, don't do this. And then they kept on doing it. So, the players, again, deserved... A good amount of blame this, and they got none. So, there is that. Um, but yeah. So, on the actual field part of things, the Astros did lose again to the A's in this game, 7 to 2. Um, the Astros are now 6 and 9, start the season. Not exactly the ideal start for them, or not, not exactly a good start for them. Um, the, I'm trying to think what happened. Oh, what else happened? Cardinals got more games postponed because they got, keep getting people to test positive for that Rona. Um, I know someone called them the St. Louis COVIDs on, um, on, on Twitter, and that's probably a bit insensitive, but also kind of funny. Um, so yeah, they're, I don't, they're, I think they're not, they were supposed to play a game, they're supposed to play a series like starting Monday, and now that's postponed, so now we're talking about them not playing games until like Wednesday, like Thursday, Friday, somewhere around there, and I don't even know how many games they've missed at this point. They were, they've only played five games, while most other teams have played like 16. Again, outside the teams that have also had to deal with postponements and things of that nature. So, don't know how you're going to make all these games up. But, hey, that's all Manfred to figure out at this point. Um, so, you got that. Also, you got the guy with the Indians. Uh, was it Please Beck? Or, or Please Act, excuse me. He left the team hotel to like meet some friends when he was in Atlanta, I believe, in Georgia. Um... No, Chicago, excuse me. I don't know why I said it. Atlanta. I, I, I was confusing them with the Marlins. Um, so, yeah, they played the when they, on Saturday when they were playing the White Sox. Um, he went out with friends in Chicago on Saturday um, after teams win against, like I said, the White Sox. And the parent of the team got, please, like a car so he wouldn't be on a plane with teammates and staff in case he contracted the virus. And, um, and um, obviously, he broke the rules, so he had to apologize. And they're... I guess he was sent home. Yeah, he was sent back to Cleveland in a car service on Sunday after the young um, kind of to quarantine himself there. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. But he's now the first person to, well, the newest person, I should say, because the first, uh, the we don't know who was patient zero with the Marlins or the Cardinals. But we know who was patient zero, at least on the Indians. And then, we, hey, we, he might not get anything. But this is why bubbles are important. This is why you can't just be like, oh, the guys, this is why I find, that's why I didn't like the whole like with thing with Trevor Lawrence. He's like, oh, guys being on campus incentivizes them to do the right things. Like, you should just do the right things. It's the right thing to do. Like, I don't think them being on campus or them being away from campus is going to do them or is going to stop anybody who wants to do the right thing. Again, if you if you want to be precautious, you want to be safe, you're going to be safe. If you're going to be a little reckless, you're going to be a little reckless. It is what it is. Like, that's not really, I don't think it's going to change depending on your location. Obviously, maybe peer pressure a little bit more on campus than you would be away from, or like back at your back at wherever your home is. But 
And like I'm saying, like, as we're seeing with guys and as we've seen like, with other major league teams, like, at the end of the day, guys are going to do what, what they think they can get away with. And he was like, hey, look, I'm just going to be in a, I'm, I'm, like, I'm just going to go out with just me up with a couple people I know. Like, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a big deal because they were just saying, like, look, you can't believe in a hotel. And he left the hotel. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's my point is that, like, people are still, like, Humans have free will. They're going to do whatever they feel like doing. And um, even if they don't think it's that serious, and again, I don't know how where they went. I don't know what he did, um, how long he was out, things like that in nature. But at the same time, he did leave the hotel. Um, so there is some sort of punishment needs to be dealt because that's kind of how we got to where we're at, where, where the Cardinals are, are we're not going to play games for like over a week. And the Marlins were out for like, over, like, for like a week, out of commission for like a week. Like it's... That it's because guys thinking like that and doing things like that. So you gotta you gotta put your foot down on that one. So he was a new guy there. Um, also, uh, speaking of new guys, or, or I guess younger guys per se, um, Fernando Tatis Jr. Excuse me, Fernando Tatis Jr. Um, he's on a hot streak right now. I think he's um, hit in a home run in like what it's called. So heading into today. He had um, five home runs this week, hitting 400 this week, and had home runs in three straight games. And then he was like, all right, you know what? Why stop now? Let me keep this thing going. So he um, decided he was just going to hit another home run on um, Sunday off of Madison Bumgarner in the Padres game against the Diamondbacks. Um, So like I said, he's now... Oh, well, the, the the Padres had a had I think it was a club record. Yes, had a club record six home runs in, in this game, which I mean that's pretty impressive. Um, in in their from their from their standpoint, the Padres offense looking at least halfway decent. They're nine and seven on the season, so not um, not too bad, but also not not that. Um, but I mean, not not like at the at the top of their division. Um, but yes, back to Tatis. 21-year-old shortstop. So, again, this kind of power surge is not necessarily um, a thing that's common among shortstops, at least. Um, or even, it's not common among young players in general, but definitely not at that position. Um, he has hit um, five in his last four games and six in his last six. He hit, he hit four in this series alone. So, he's on the hot streak. He's, he's been on base 17 straight games, dating, dating back to the last game of 2019. Um well, I guess his last game in 2019 because he, he had a stress fracture in his back and didn't finish out the season. Um, so he's seen the ball well and hitting him good. Um, so that that's good for them because you wanted to see a um, natural, progress, natural progression for him. Because yeah, he played good last year. He had some injuries that, that um, caused him to miss some time. And now he's continuing that off as well. He's hitting 333 on the year. Now, now up to eight home runs. 18 RBIs, eight home runs. It's for second in the in the league. So... That's how Florida his 18 home runs are top for third in the league. So that's what you like to see. That is what you like to see from that standpoint. Um, again, so you see if, because I know they got off to the hot start, they kind of, I guess, obviously faltered a little bit, but now. Um, got to see they're in a decent spot for the wild card. Just because, well, that's the 7-8 the spot because um, they got a better record than everybody else that's currently in the in the third spot in their, own, in their respective divisions. And so there's that. Speaking of divisions... Um, in their own division, it's not the Dodgers at the top. It's the Rockies, which has surprised me a little bit when I saw this. The Rockies are 11-4 and four over their first 15 games. Um, they, they, um, let's see, they, they've played, they've beaten, uh, so far, who, who have they played? They played the, the Rangers, um, took two from them. They took two from the A's. They took three, no, two out of three from the Padres. They took um, three out of four from the Giants. And then now they've taken two out of three from the Mariners. And now and they play the uh, the Diamondbacks and the Rangers again coming up this week. And then they play the the Astros and the Dodgers. The following week. So that would be an interesting week for them. Uh, the week of the, 20, the 17th of August. That would be the, the interesting week. Even the, the Astros aren't that good right now, but again, they have good players. Not to the Dodgers, that'll be big because then that was like kind of a, a big um, 
series to a division and good, big three game series. Although that was interesting, just the fact that the Rangers, kind of a team that's always kind of like, sort of, kind of, sort of like sneaky good. Um, but people don't really talk about them. Um, Charlie Blackman obviously is having a season to remember so far. He's hitting 458 um, with three home runs, five doubles, 18 RBIs. Um, so he's seeing the ball well, doing good things. Daniel Murphy's in 364 for them, uh, three home runs, 11 RBIs. Uh, Trevor Stories had five home runs in 276. Um, Nolan Arenado is not really off to a hot start, which, hey. Um, but again, you kind of expect him to get it, things turned around eventually. You would you would hope, and then from a pitching standpoint, their pitchers aren't really doing that bad. Uh, Marquez is three and two. Freeland's three and two. Um, both of those guys have ERAs under two point five. Uh, Senzatella, their third pitcher, I believe, has a ERA of two six five. So the pitching's been really good this year, obviously as well. The only really bad people so far are Wade Davis, but he's only pitched 2.2 innings, and um, this other guy named Pezos, and he's only pitched two-thirds of an inning. But most of the other, most of the other relievers are looking pretty good. So that's a, that's a welcome sight to see. So yeah, we'll see if they continue up their hot streak, and they weren't the only surprise top of the division, to me at least, the, the, Mar- the, Mar- uh, the Marlins are currently second in the NL East. At seven and three, in, in the midst, like again, they got makeshift Ross, They had to deal with a lot of COVID stuff, and they're still looking good. We'll see how long it can last. But they're still looking good. Cubs looking good. That's not unsurprising. That's not surprising. Um, but also, as we talked about them a little bit ago, the Oakland A's are our first in the AL West. They are twelve and four. Um, best. No, the okay. Well, they have the most wins in the league. The best winning percentage goes. To those Cubs who are ten and three, but they have the second best winning percentage. Which shout out to them. And so yeah, they're they're, they're looking good so far. They like I said, they just finished beating up on the Astros. Took three straight from them. Before that, took three straight from the Rangers. Before that, took three straight from the from the Mar- Mariners. Uh, yeah, because three straight they lost once to the Mariners. Then they, like I said, they had their series with the Rockets. They lost both of those, and then they took. Um, they took three out of four from the Angels to open the season. So, they're looking good. Um, from their perspective, uh, Marcus Simeon. No, Marcus Simeon is not playing that well. Um, none of their hitters are actually hitting that well. It's surprising. They don't have a single guy over 300. I guess they're just doing the little things. Matt Olsen has five home runs. Obviously, he had the, the walk-off grand slam to open their season. So, again, maybe it's about time the hits as opposed to just a big accumulation of the hits. But if you get them at the right time, that's almost just as good. Let's see pitching wise. Maybe they gotta have some good pitchers. Oh yeah, they're they're the front end of their rotation is um, pretty good. Um Montes is um two and one in twenty three innings with a one point five seven ERA, one point oh uh whip. Um Lazardo is one and oh in seventeen in, in the third innings, two point six ERA. Some guy named Bassett, I've never heard of him before. Um, but he has one win in 16 and two-thirds innings, ERA of 1.08. And the bullpen is looking to be pretty decent. Um, Hendricks, Liam Hendricks, um, 2.61, 2.16, excuse me, ERA with five saves. Joaquin Soria has pitched seven in two-thirds innings, hasn't given up a single earned run so far. So that's shout out to him for that. Um, two saves. So yeah, clearly there are most of their starters. Obviously, not everybody, but the the, the couple other starters, the areas look very much shaky. But like I said, just interesting to see where everybody's at. Again, we're about a third into the season. After I guess about um, Wednesday, Thursday, somewhere around there, will be officially a third into the season. So before we got there, I wanted to take a look and see where we're at. Um, and like I said, I thought there was some interesting surprises at the top some of the divisions because I mean the A's are always kind of like sneaky good. Again, they're another team. Kind of like the Rays, where you're always like, like you're always like kind of surprised when you see them. Like, oh, they're still a top, and you're just like, oh, well, yeah. They they just find guys that are useful and good for them, and, and then they don't pay them the money that they deserve, and let them or trade them, let them walk or do whatever. But it works for them, so and it's working. Like I so said, the Yankees are still good. Um, 
their division is not as good. The Orioles are second, but they're in second place right now at seven and seven. Um, Minnesota got that hot start, kind of cooled off a little bit, but it's still leading the division. A lot of divisions very close. Um, all the divisions are really kind of close. No, well, the AL East and AL Central all within three and a half games. Um, the AL West is a little bit different. The Angels aren't really off to a hot, the hottest of starts. Um, the NL East is within four games. The NL Central is not because the Pirates stink. So they're eight and a half games behind the Cubs now. And the NL West is is five and a half games between the five teams. So I'm interested to see kind of how these teams see who kind of cools off, who continue to stay at hot, who kind of picks it up. They'll be interesting to file, see if, like I said, Tatis can continue his hot streak. Um, the Orioles, not the Orioles, but the Marlins can continue to be one of the best teams in the NL. Um, if um, who kind of jockeying for position between the the Rockies and the Dodgers. Um, again, see if the Oakland A's, it seems like their division is playing very poorly right now, obviously because the Astros aren't playing that well. So that helps them a lot. In fact, their division is not that good. See if they can, like I said, see if they can keep it up. See what kind of happens in the a, um, the NL Central and the I mean, AL Central in the AL East, just because they're all kind of tight right now. So make sure to keep an eye on as we continue on throughout the season. So as we come back here, um, I want to discuss the NBA award finalists were put out. And there were, I mean, most of them are like pretty point blank, kind of um, pretty standard, no real surprises. But there was one award where I think there's going to at least be a little bit of discussion only because of who was actually nominated and why many people feel like he shouldn't be nominated. Not because he's bad, but just because he's almost too good, if that makes sense. So we'll talk about that one in detail the most, but then we'll talk about some of the other ones too and who I think is going to win, things like that, right after the break. So stay right there. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Podcast Network. So we'll save the one I want to talk about the most for last. I think that's going to be the biggest discussion. I don't want to like get get too caught up in the in the debate and discussion before I, and then I end up taking forty five minutes to get through all the other awards. Obviously not forty five. You, you get the point. You guys know I talk a lot. Um, so the first one MVP. Um, no surprises there. Giannis, Harden, LeBron. Was hoping maybe they could have snuck a Chris Paul in there because I mean again he's not going to win. Obviously. But um he could at least be top three just because um just because what he's been able to do with on the team again. He's not doing it alone. He's got some help. You obviously got Gallinari. He's averaging like nineteen points somewhere around there, shooting like forty percent from three. He's been great. Um Shea's been great in terms of his progression and what he's been able to do. He's gonna to continue to grow on where he was at last year. That's been important for them. And important for him, obviously, because um, he's the future for them at the point guard position, potentially. Though, I mean, he's playing mainly the two now. So, we'll see if they get a true point guard. I mean, not true, because he's he can he is a point guard. He can be a point guard, but to see if they get a point guard to pair with him down the line. Um, but for right now, Chris Paul's been a good mentor for him. And again, they've been one of the best. He's been arguably the best clutch, clutch player in the entire league Chris Paul has. And they have the three guard lineup with him, Dennis, SGA, plus Danilo and Chris, and Stephen Adams this is the best five man lineup in the league in terms of net rating, and different things. 
And like I said, that's one of the reasons why they are never really out of a game. They've made big comebacks, especially late in games. Um, or in like in the second half of games, things like that. So they never, they never really figured out. And a lot of that comes because of Chris Paul and his leadership and getting everybody to focus and buy in almost every night. Again, because they still have their stinkers sometimes. They, they put up a rough one against the Grizzlies. I think it was Friday. The only game the Grizzlies won in the bubble, I believe. So that was a mess. But other than that, I mean, generally speaking, they're not gonna, they're not really gonna get blown out. They're always gonna be in the games, always gonna be keeping close, keeping competitive, even if they don't always win. Yeah, it's never going to be like they're always going to be a tough a tough team to beat, which is why I have them as has been saying one team. I think are going to be a tough out. Again, they might not make it to the conference finals or anything like that, but they're going to be a team that is going to give a higher seed team everything they can handle for five, six, seven games, and many other games the series go. So he could have snuck in, but again, the three that that are in there makes sense. I mean, James Harden's still been great. LeBron's been LeBron, even though some people are arguing Anthony Davis is the best player on that team. Um, I still wouldn't go that far. Though, again, he's leading them in a lot of different categories. Um, I wouldn't go that far unless I was trolling. But um, LeBron, again, doing what he's doing. Still putting up the points with all the assists he's getting. Now, at his age, is still very impressive. Because a lot of guys at his age... I mean, even... Like, every time Melo has a good game, it's like a big deal. No no offense to Melo. Because, again, he's a Hall of Famer and different things like that. But, like, people are like, surprised. They're like, oh, wow, look at Melo. He can still, like, hit clutch shots and things like that. Like... People expect LeBron to still be good. So it was a little, like, the, the... And again, we're talking about, like, GOAT status as opposed to, like, Hall of Fame status. There's, there's, there's a gap between those two, surprisingly enough. Um, but, yeah, it's just different from his own class. And D-Wade's retired. Like, a lot of people from his... That are his age aren't really doing what they're doing. Chris Paul's really the only other one that's playing at, like, at a really, really, really high level. Like, all-star or all-NBA caliber level at that age. And even, again, Chris Paul is not LeBron. So there's that. It makes sense, but you know, it's going to go back to back, in my opinion, especially since the bubble doesn't really matter. Even though you know, LeBron's been a little shaky in the bubble. Um, first game is the Clippers, the game that they really seem to care about. He played well, at least down the stretch, was shaky for the first three quarters. But the rest of the games, it's been kind of like, yeah, it hasn't been terrible, but he hasn't been like great in all those games either. He looked a little old from time to time, so there's that. Um, but yeah, I think Yon's going to go back to back. I'd be shocked if anything else happened there. Um, six man. This is weird for me because you got two six men from the same team, and obviously, like, that can't work because, in theory, only one of them can be the six man. Um, just to think that's, I mean, it's semantics, but, like, you get my point. Is that, like, oh, it's supposed to be, like, if you're going to go by its namesake, it's the six man, like the, like, like, the best next guy off the bench. And, again, if you have two guys, then they, they can't both be the six, they, they, it's not the six men of the year. It's six man. So there's that. So you got Lou Will, um, Harold Montrez, and Dennis Schroeder in that category. I personally, and I'm biased because I am a Thunder fan. But I mean again, Lou Will got enough. Like like let somebody else get one for one time. So um Montrez or or Dennis is is the pick for me. But again, Dennis, I, I just feel like cause he's a guy and I mean Lou Will in the same way, Montrez in the same way, but like he's a, he's a young he is young enough to where like he could and should be starting on a team somewhere. Whether or not they're good or bad is or is in depends because obviously he started in the Hawks and they weren't that good, but that might not have been completely his fault. But this year, he's strictly coming off the bench. Does not does not ever start. He started once the entire season, and he's playing thirty minutes a game, forty seven percent from the field. 38% from three, so 37 for nine if you want to be technical. Um, 83% for the free throw line, adding four assists, um, 3.7 rebounds, and almost 19 points a game. Again, while being a part of like that three guard lineup with him, Shea, and Chris Paul is the best five man group in terms of net rating in the, in the NBA. I don't know if it's, I mean, it was coming into the bubble. I don't know. Well, I guess they haven't played with it, so I imagine it would still be the best. Though, I, again, maybe somebody passed him. Who knows? But, again, he's a part of it, and he's the big reason why. Like, that that scoring off the bench is something that they did not have or they would not have without him. And that's and also, he's having, what, this is his, his highest scoring total in his two years with OKC. Because then he obviously came to OKC in the Mellow trade. He was pretty good last year for them off the bench, but just wasn't shooting as well from the field and from three. And now he's kind of settled into that role better. And now, again, he's playing... 
a start like star like a starting caliber point guard. And so I think that's my reason for why I think he should be the sixth man again. Everyone's opinion will be a little bit different. But again, just like um just it's just that um it's just that it's just the net rating for me. Just like he's a part of like like I said, the one of the best five man units in the league while also leading a second unit where like the second unit really doesn't have a whole lot of scoring in it. You got a bunch of young guys that you're talking about guys coming off their bench. You got Ham Du Diallo, um, Darius Baisley, Nerlens Noel. Um, you don't got really a guy. I mean, Nerlens Noel is, is 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 fine in the pick and roll, but Lou Will and Montrez have each other, and that helps. And also, he's averaging more points than Lou Will, so there's that less assists. But again, he doesn't have. He's not playing with Paul George. He's not playing with Sham. He's not playing with even Kawhi, who can be knockdown shooters. He's playing with. Decent shooters. Like, yeah, Danilo's a good shooter. Um, Chris Paul can hit threes, so it's not like he's playing with nobodies, but um, it's just like, hey, it's just a little bit different for me. In my, again, this maybe it's just me, this is just my biasness. This is even, like, the best. Like, last year, last couple of years, he's been averaging, like, 20 points a game. Lou Will has. This is a little bit of a down year for him. He's only averaging 18. And like I say, he's won the sixth man of the year, like, three times. Like, hey, you know, let, let somebody else get a shine. He's also averaging more points than my tries as well. Montrez is 18.6 and 7.1, and Lou Will is at 18.2. Um, Though both of them are playing less minutes, which again makes sense because the Clippers are a better team, so they don't have to play as many minutes. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just like for me personally, I just think that he should be the guy. But again, that's probably biased. If it's not him, then I give it to Montrez over Lou Will. But I think people are just going to give it to Lou Will because he's just synonymous with the award at this point. Um. But like I said, I'm biased. I like I, I like Lou Will, I like Montrez though, so it's not like I despise those guys. I just think it'd be cool for Dennis to get it. Um, but I like I said, I doubt he will. Even though semantics wise, it makes no sense that two guys, two a team got two six men of the year candidates. Like how does that work? Um, rookie of the year, you got Ja, you got Zion, and the few games he's played, and then you got Kendrick Nunn. Shout out to him. Uh, kind of an unheralded guy, a guy that no one really knew about coming to season. He's been great for them. I think he played well in the summer league. That's kind of where he got his start. Um, but he's been great for them. Obviously, that one will be Ja. Design didn't play enough. And Ja's been the best player on a team that's going to potentially, at least going to be in a playing, probably. Um, to the, with the record that the Grizzlies have now, is guaranteed to be a playing game. So, he'll at least have a shot to make the playoffs. And again, the Heat are going to make the playoffs too, but at, at the same time, Jimmy Butler is the best player. Like that's clear. Or 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 if it's not Jimmy Butler's band, like Kendrick Nunn's like third, fourth, maybe fifth, depending on the game. And also, he just left the bubble, kind of in weird circumstances. I hope everything's all right with him in that regard. But again, Jaws out there by himself, his best, well, second best player, Jerry Jackson Jr. So not completely by himself. But now he's gone, so now he's really by himself. You got like you got guys like Van Chunch, you got Dylan Brooks. You got, um, who else? Anthony Tava was good randomly in the game against the Thunder. Kyle Anderson, slow mo. Again, it's not not the same caliber of guy. And also, new head coach is like Eric Spolster is like, he's, he's, he's certified, he's won championships, things like that. So it's a little, like I said, things are a little bit different, in my opinion. So, not like the same caliber, but again, it's just, it is John Morant because I didn't play enough games. So that's basically where we're at. Even though, again, Kendrick Nunn. Had a good season. I'm not trying to knock him and act like he's a nobody. Because um, Kendrick Nunn did have a good season, especially for a rookie. Which I think he went, I'm pretty sure he went undrafted too. Like, it's not like he even was like um, a high draft pick. Also 25. So there is that. But yeah, I think he was in GD for a little bit. Had to work his way up. Jaws doing himself with like 20, 21, something like that. And he's averaging, not bad, he's averaging 15. Three assists, about three rebounds a game, uh, shooting forty four percent, thirty six percent from thirty five point six percent from three, and eighty four percent from the line. While Ja is at, they not have Ja or oh, but I said, where is his name at? He's averaging seventeen point eight, seven assists, three point seven rebounds, shooting forty eight percent from the field, thirty four percent from three. So it could work on that a little bit. And 77% from the line could work on that as well. But again, he's the best player on that team. So he has to be the guy most nice. So again, just different circumstances. So that's why I think I think Ja probably gets obviously gonna get the edge there. 
Who else we got? Who what else we got? We got um we got defense player of the year, Giannis, A D and Gobert. My money's on Anthony Davis. Like that's who I would put it on, but I don't think he's gonna get it. I think they might just give it to Giannis. Though Giannis is a weird one because like you watch some of the games and you're like, Oh, he doesn't like guard like the best guy all the time. So that's interesting. Um like, like again that um the the Mavs game. Like Luca's dominating. You think all right, you defense player of the year you're a wing, like you're, I mean, he's sometimes playing the five when they go big. So that, that hurts his case too. Um, but then you would say that, all right, like, let me guard Luca. Like, again, like in the, in the playoffs, Paul George, Kawhi, those guys are going to guard Luca. They're not going to pass it off to Jermichael Green. They're not going to pass it off to Marcus Morris every time. He's like, but again, the crunch time, I imagine those guys are going to put on him. That wasn't Giannis yesterday. So that was interesting to me. Um, but again, Anthony Davis, he's averaging, 2.3 blocks, 1.4 steals, um, grabbing seven defensive rebounds a game. Like, I think that's my guy. And Gobert is again, he's solid. He's he's won enough of them. And also, but he did get worked by. Um, he was getting worked by Jokic the other night, and that was bad. Um, but yeah, Giannis only averaging 1.1 blocks, one steal a game. So different. And they they have solid team defense. Also, he's. He he can be run protected, but Burke Lopez is the is the block guy. Like not that not that Anthony Davis doesn't also have block guys, but and Dwight Howard on his bench, but just like he's he's he has to be that rim protector sometimes. Giannis doesn't always have to be that. He can be that, but that doesn't usually he's out there with Brooke, and Brooke can do that. And so that's just in my in my opinion for the versatility and different things. I'm going to give it to Anthony Davis, but I don't know if they will like the award voters. I think they're going to give it to Giannis, but I, I put my money on Anthony Davis. Um, we also got Coach of the Year, which is between Nick Nurse, um, Billy Donovan. Shout out to Billy, because I did not think he was a good coach. And now, now suddenly it makes me look like a fool. And my my Boonholzer. Um, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be Bud because he won it last year. He's won it before. The and the Bucks are supposed to be good. And like that, you shouldn't get credit for that. Um, now I think, like I said, Billy Donovan, Nick Nurse. It's a tight one. I know when the coaches voted, I believe they already had. Boonholzer and Donovan in the tie, though Nick Nurse was one vote behind them from being a three-way tie. But I think the vote, the, the award should be between Bill Donovan and Nick Nurse because those are two. The Thunder were left for like everyone, just like they're going to be sorry. They have no chance. Like ESPN, like their BPI or whatever thing they calculate to determine who's going to make the playoffs, put them at like a 0.2 percent chance, something like that. So no one thought they were going to be anywhere close to good, and yet here they are in the playoffs. Might even be like a top four seed. In the West, which would be a quite an accomplishment, and then you got the and then you got the Raptors who lost Kawhi, their best player, lost Danny Green, the vital role player for them, and yet they're back where they were last year, number two in the West, number two in the East, and and you could argue this team is just as good as that team was last year. Again, having lost Kawhi Leonard, who's a top five, top ten player in the league at worst, depending on who you ask. And yet, the Raptors don't have that top 10 guy, but yeah, they're just as good. And that's a testament to Nick Nurse. And also, like I said, they've gotten, they got guys being out, missed, missed a lot of games this year. Um, and yet, the train just keeps on rolling in, in Toronto. So, I don't know. I'll probably give it to Billy only because, like, people, at least, perhaps people thought the Raptors could make the playoffs, at least. Everyone thought, everyone was like, oh yeah, the Thunder are going to be in, in the lottery. They might even be like a, like a top five pick, something like that. Like they, they everyone thought they were, um, they were going to be sorry, and they're not exactly sorry. So I feel like in that regard, um, that should give him a little bit of an edge over those other two guys. Um, but again, that's just me. That's um, um, again, not everybody's going to agree with that, but hey, that's just how I feel about it. And then lastly. The last, um, the last awards, most improved player, which is the one I want to talk about the most, because that had Luca in it. That had um, who was it? Uh, Brandon Ingram and Bam Adebayo. So, in theory, you're like, all right, who's the best player? Luca, obviously. But I'm saying with that, that's the reason why I don't think he should be up for the award. Because when you're a guy that was a top three pick in your second year, in theory. You should get better. That's not that shocking to me. In theory, you should get better. 
Like that's just all right. Like again, it's, and then and also like say he was rookie of the year, and then um, he averaged what? Um, where was he at? He was at twenty one. He averaged twenty one points last year, seven point eight rebounds, six six assists. Um, shot seventy one percent from free throw line. Needed to improve on that. Um, thirty two percent from three, and forty two percent from the field. But again, as a rookie, um, playing thirty plus minutes a game, that's not bad. Then the second year, he's now an all-star caliber player, shooting 46% from the field, shooting only 31% from three, but he's shooting like nine threes. I don't know why he's shooting so many. Um, and 75% from the free throw line. So he's improved there, improved in his rebound. He's up to 9.5, improved in assists. He's at, he's at nine or 8.9 and improved in his points. He's at 29. Though, again, he didn't have he didn't have a Chris Stapps on the team last year. So that helps as well. Um, but just with him, like his natural progression was just like, he like his, his progression is different than a Bam Adebayo or, or a Brandon Ingram or like a Devontae Graham we talked about. But even Devontae Graham is an interesting one for me just because his is all just like the product of having more playing time, in my personal opinion. Like last year, he averaged 14 points a game, and 14 minutes a game. Excuse me, only playing 46. Now he's averaging 35 minutes a game. So of course he's going to put up better numbers. Like that's just like, that just makes sense. He's still shooting 38% from the field, so he's shooting way too much. She hit thirty seven percent from three though, so there is that. But again, if you do his per thirty six minutes for the first two years, he's only gone up like seven points. He's gone up one as one point three assists, and he's gone up like point one rebound. So again, obviously he didn't average those per thirty six numbers in the first year because he did wasn't getting those kind of minutes. But again, it's just a product from being on a bad team, having a lot of minutes. Again, he's been good. I think a lot of a lot of it's and also he's a second year guy. You you want guys to see guys improve. That's why I don't think Shea was in it. Because again, he's improved this year too, but again, he's he's around other good guys and and it's just like he's he was I mean he wasn't a, he wasn't the third pick, um but he's a lottery pick like again you you expect those guys to get better the next year like that that shouldn't be that surprising in my opinion. But when you look at Bam, you look at Brandon Ingram, those were guys where it was like oh, do they have that star in them? And you you were uncertain like you didn't think suddenly like now Bam he's in his third year. And his minutes have gone up every year. But now, instead of averaging... Last year, he was averaging 8.9 points in 23 minutes. He's getting 34 minutes now. And he's averaging 16.1. Nearly doubled his, his points. He's averaging 5.1 assists over 2.2 last year. So, doubled his assists. Averaging 10 rebounds instead of 7.3 rebounds. Um, he's... His free throw shooting is not any better. Um... And his field goal percentage isn't that much better. But he's shooting twice as much, and as opposed to 5.9 last year, shooting like 11 shots per game now. And again, having Jimmy Butler on the team definitely helps. But that's the that's like all right, that's a big improvement from cause even from year one to year two. You didn't really improve that that much in terms of statistically. But now from year two to year three, it's like all right, okay, now we're on to something. He went from like all right, is this like can he be that kind of guy to like oh now he's an all star guy and he's starting all the time and different things like that. Same thing with the Brandon Ingram. Like, Brandon Ingram was the guy who's like, can he be that star? Like, he got shipped out. Well, I mean, he got shipped out because he had the best, highest potential of the Lakers, like, young core. But it was like, could he be that number one guy on the team? And because kind of heading into year four, people were uncertain. All right, you knew he could score a little bit, but can he be that guy on a team? And again, the team's not going to make the playoffs. But he was that guy for most of the year um, with no Zion. It was averaging, I think, like 25 points per game before he came back. It was an all-star, like I said, shooting... Um, 46% from the field, 39% from three, 85% from free throw line, 23.9 points, 4.2 assists, 6.1 rebounds, all improvements from the year before, which is what you would like to see. Especially the free throw. The free throw jumped up from, he was at 67%, now he's up to 85 So that, that's a big difference. But yeah, those are what I'm saying. Bam and Ingram, those are guys like, all right, they... Those are the most improved kind of caliber guys. So that makes sense. Luca is just a, like, look, Luca was good already. Like, him being, I mean, is he, was he supposed to be this good? All right, you could argue that. But he's, like, him being good is not surprising. Him being an all star is not surprising. He, averaged, he could have been an all star last year. But that's not surprising. Ingram, bam, those guys weren't anywhere near all star caliber guys. So, like, when you see all, like, the like the Victor Oladipos, the Paul George, those kind of guys where it's like, these guys weren't supposed to be this good this year. And now, like, oh, they kind of came onto the scene. They kind of surprised some people. Like, that's who I view a most improved guy as. That's why I think it'll, it should go to Brandon Ingram. 
Though, if Luca's in there, that kind of already makes it a little shaky to me. That means, like, they might have just voted him in. But I'd give it to Ingram. Um, like I said, Bam second. Because Luca, just like, again, he's the best out of the three, obviously. He could very well easily be a top five player next year. Um, especially, at least offensively, defense still leaves something to be desired. But offensively, he could be a top five player in the league next year. Like that, he might honestly be that this year. Um, as I said, he was supposed to be good. He was great as a rookie, one rookie of the year. Um, so this is not surprising that he's now continuing to be this good in the second year. And again, I feel like second year is honestly a weird year to give most improved because you're, you're, in theory, supposed to improve from your rookie year. Especially if you're a high dropper, you should improve. You should get better. That only makes sense. If you don't, that's when it's a problem. And that's why I think like guys like Ingram and Bam, these that's why they're on the can you know, they were their canis because they were like, all right, they didn't really get that much better. Um the their the next couple of years in the league, obviously Ingram's in his fourth, Bam's in his third. But like from year one to year two, like was Bam better? Probably, and you thought maybe he could become this if he got more playing time, but he wasn't this yet. And now he's there. Um, Ingram had 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 stats in terms of scoring and stuff, but he hadn't really put together on a nightly basis in terms of being that number one guy like he did this year. Which is why, again, it was impressive of him doing. That's why he was an all star. So I'm saying those are those are the kind of guys I view. And like I said, it's just a debate around it because, like, again, Luca is the best player, but it's like he was already supposed to be good. So like, how do you? How do you factor that into this kind of discussion? It's a, it's a fair question to ask. And kind of just like, there needs to be like some sort of set criteria. Like, all right, you can't be in your second year and be on the and on the ballot. Because I think that seems reasonable in my opinion. Because like Devontae Graham, like again, he's just a product of more playing time. Like I feel like, and I don't know if that's, all right, is he better than he was as a rookie? Maybe because he's getting more playing time. So that means that people trust him more. But at the same time, he if he just, if he was on a better team, he wouldn't be this good, in my personal opinion. He's just a product of being able to get a lot of men's on a bad team and getting a lot of shots up. Because he's shooting under 40% from the field. That is, by no stretch of the imagination, is that good. Um, but again, he's scoring a lot of points. He's hit a lot of clutch shots for them, so that that's a big for them. But again, it's just like one of those things where, like, if you get a lot of minutes, all right, you probably gonna get some. You're gonna get a lot of shots up. You're gonna get some points. That's not that's not surprising to me. It shouldn't be surprising to anyone. Um, but yeah, just like Luca shouldn't. That my whole point is Luca shouldn't just replace him with somebody, even if it's not Shea. Because again, he's second year, so that that kind of that would be con- con- contradictory. I don't know who you put on there, but just like even if you only put two, I mean, I guess you have to put three. But it's just like Luca being on there just looks weird to me. Cool. Like, yes, did he improve? Of course he did. Now it's clear as day. He's a better player than he was last year. But he was also really good last year, so it's not like I'm that shocked that he's this good this year. I'm just like, like I did not expect Brandon Ingram to be an All Star this year. Maybe, maybe I was just messing out. I mean, people thought he could be as good because he was drafted high, but I didn't expect Bam out of body to be an All Star this year. The second best player on the playoff team this year. I didn't expect that, so that's why I feel like they're in the candidates. Luca, I expected Luca to be good. I expected the Mavericks to compete for the playoffs. Like those are all things that I expected. So he's exceeding my expectations at the same time, but like he's also meeting them because that's where I thought he could be this good this year. I said, Ingram, bam, I didn't. That's why I think those, that's usually why those are the guys I would view as the most improved as opposed to like, again, like a Luca. But again, DJ's own, everyone has their different um, criteria for these type of things. So we'll see what happens when the awards are given out in the, I don't even know when they're going to be given out because normally they have the award show, but I don't even know if they're going to be doing that this year because like, it's going to be super late now. No one's even going to care. I mean, already no one cares, but like, extra no one's going to care. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But yeah. Well, I guess we'll see what happens when all that is decided. But that'll do it for me here today. I know this has been a little bit of a longer episode. Um, but had a lot to discuss. So, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you guys for listening. That has been another episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast presented by GSMC Podcast Network. If you like you've heard today, if you like you've heard on past episodes, you want to make sure you never miss an episode. Subscribe to the podcast. Uh, make sure, like I said, you you never miss an episode. You're always on top when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you like to hear whatever your whatever platform you listen to this on, um, give us a five star rating, write us a nice review. We're very appreciated, very helpful. Lots to see what you guys like, what you guys dislike, the ways we can improve, all that fun stuff. And also, if you're on social media, we're on social media. So you can find us there: Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss. We can talk NBA bubble, 
We can talk NHL bubbles. We can talk about MLB. We can talk about WNBA if we want to talk about WNBA. We can talk about the college football season. Probably not happening. We can talk about if you think the NFL season is going to happen. Or going to be, well, it's going to start. But if you think it's going to be completed. Anything. Anything your heart desires. We are more than willing to discuss with you guys. So reach out to us there. And we can talk about these things. Also, before I get out of here, like I do every episode, I want to shout out the essential workers. Um, doctors, nurses, EMTs, first responders, um, firefighters, postal service people. They're going through a lot. Grocery store workers, retail workers. Um, anyone that's been deemed essential during this pandemic, shout out to you again. I know you're dealing, you've been dealing with a lot of stuff, continue to deal with a lot of stuff. And like I said, not everybody shows their appreciation for you, but I know I do. Delivery drivers as well, FedEx, UPS, Amazon. Helping to make sure that I can stay safe. And don't have to leave my house to get things that I want all the time. Again, some things you got to do, food and stuff, you got you to gotta leave the house. I mean, well, you don't have to. You can get Instacart. But I usually, like, my family usually leave the house for that. But other things, like clothes, um, shoes, different things like that. Um, things I need around the house. Amazon. Um, order them off the websites, different things like that. I said just to make sure I don't have to leave the house. And deal with people not wearing masks. No, I mean, where I live, it's usually pretty good with the masks. But... Again, everyone has different opinions on it, so I just prefer to be safe rather than sorry. Shout out to, to the essential workers to make sure that I can be safe. Um, if Again, if you choose to be one of those people that wants to be safe. Some people do, some people don't. It's all, it's all relative, so shout out to you guys. Shout out to, like I said, if you're going to a bar, going to a restaurant during these times, just make sure you tip your bartenders, waiters, waitresses, um, delivery drivers, um, Uber, Lyft, whoever, any of your services, just because, again... It'll be appreciated, I imagine. Like I said, if you got it, cool. If you don't got it, I understand. Because, again, I know they the unemployment thing is kind of a bit of a mess right now. Um, but I said, if you got it, just, just tip them. I imagine these people will appreciate it as well. But, yeah, that'll do it for me here today. Oh, well, before I get out of here, wear a mask. Um, but that'll do it for me here today. I've been Chris Blades. Uh, that has been my time. And until next time. Peace out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program